to government and, and get uh, recapitalization, um, they wouldn't have, they were not appearing before this committee. Okay. But uh, once you start uh, asking money from us, it's like uh, sending an invitation to us. So uh, that's 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 the background. Um, I've we have gone through the the, the presentation DM um, quite an, an, an elaborate um, um, uh, pre, uh, pre presentation, um, and would like so <clears throat> we'll give you time limits and have that at the back of your minds that uh, 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 very detailed that we have, we have read that. Um, and let me make an example. For instance, a slide which will, will which talks to um, what you applied for at, at NERSA and what you got. It's 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 it's, it's, it's quite a detailed slide. But for instance, if you were to summarize the slide, we'll say that's how much we 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 we, we wanted. That's a tariff that we wanted. That's what we're given, and uh, that's the impact of 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 of, of that. And what you, you 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 are going to be doing about it, uh, but if you go to the slide, it's quite detailed. It talks about all the kilowatts and so on and so forth. So, um, all members, uh, allow me to uh, hand over to to the deputy minister, Honourable um, Maswale, and 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 the team ESCOM. Would like to to say to you, um, maximum, maximum. You don't have to take all the time. But we are giving you up to ten o'clock. Uh, we'll be doing listening in in in, in the and we hope we, we promise not to interrupt you, not unless there's really really something that we see. But I think let's just allow you a DM and your team to to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, honourable chair, and greetings to the honourable uh, members of the committee. Uh, I will likewise chair. Uh, welcome the opportunity and indicate uh, forthwith that uh, I will le let uh, the, the uh, interim chair to really take on the presentation. And um, you have already noted the minister's absence uh, uh, today. There is a couple of uh, meetings that are sitting. Uh, we have shared uh, the responsibilities for the attendance to the different meetings. Uh, uh, so, so that accounts for the absence of uh, uh, Minister Kotan. Uh, the, the, the Professor Mahoba is, is here with the team from uh, ESCOM. Uh, perhaps uh, I should just, uh, without uh, wasting any time, invite them to take the stage uh, in the time you have availed, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Deputy Minister and Honourable Members of, uh, of SCOA, uh, it's a great opportunity that we have been given uh, to come and present, I think, to your committee. Uh, you have given us a mandate uh, and we have uh, uh, prepared ourselves accordingly. Uh, we have sent our documents to yourselves. Uh, they are quite extensive, but it would be important, I think, for the team of ESCOM that is going to present to highlight only those issues that are relevant because the details are there in the narrative and also in the presentations of the slide. The team will be commanded by the GCE, Mr. Andre Direita, and I'll give him the opportunity to start uh, the presentation. But as the chair has indicated, we should be done with by 10 o'clock and everybody must simply select those slides that highlight the important issues that the committee should grapple with rather than every slide that you have prepared. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, Deputy Minister, and Honorable Ministers, I mean, Honorable uh, Committee Members. I will hand over now to Mr. Andre Dureta to start the presentation. Thank you. Uh, morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and uh, good morning also to the Honourable Chair, um, Honourable Deputy Minister, Honourable Members. Uh, as the uh, Prof has said, it's a privilege and honour for us to present to you. We are 
going to try and be as brief as possible. Uh, we do have a lot of ground to cover. We've tried to share as much information as possible. Um, and we will now start um, with our presentation. Uh, the um, agenda clearly is, is as per the questions raised by SCOA. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to our Chief Financial Officer, Caleb Kassim, to uh, start with uh, his section of the presentation. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, good morning, Honorable Chairperson, uh, members of the committee, Deputy Minister, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna try to do the finance section in about 10 minutes. Chair, I think the first important uh, slide is slide three. Just to recap for the committee members, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, yes, uh, over the period since 2008, uh, uh, if you go back one slide there, Natasha, it just shows that the support that Eskom has received from government from the 60 billion initially loan and in the conversion, a subsequent uh, 23 billion uh, equity support in 2015-16, and then as the committee has appropriated uh, in the last financial year, 49 billion, and then we built in the 56 billion for this financial year. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, this totals 188 billion rand of support for ESKIM over the period, uh, which we are very appreciative to ensure we can meet our debt service commitments uh, as and when they become due. Here, if we then move on, I think just to touch on slide five, if we skip that, next slide. I think this is an important slide. In terms of the uh, requirements of the appropriation chair for the last financial year, you will see the cash flow statement is firstly draft because it's not yet, we haven't completed our audit. What we highlighting here, uh, chairperson, is that from an inflow perspective for the last financial year, Eskom generated 36.2 billion rand from its cash from operations. And then with the government support of 49 billion, which flowed during the course of the year, it used that to cover the debt service commitments of 70.6 billion with some of the balanced incoming from our cash from operations. Chairperson you will also see that over the last financial year, effectively Eskom raised debt of 32 billion to cover our investment in capital expenditure. The point I'm highlighting here, and the critical uh, requirement of, of uh, the appropriation and the to service our principal debt as well as the interest which we've done in the last financial year ended March, 2020. And just to highlight the importance and the need again, during this financial year, our debt service commitments for FY21, uh, our principal and our interest adds up to 95 billion of which we will utilize 56 billion from the support and in uh, our cash from operations that we generate and further debt funding. Uh, if we can then move on to slide eight, um, uh, Natasha, thank you. Can I continue? Continue? I think, stop here. Yeah. Okay, you can leave it here. I think, Chair, uh, what's important, we know that the three funds of, of uh, uh, that we generate our cash from is obviously the operations which I've highlighted in the cash flow. Then Eskom raises it uh, based on what the market appetite and what our balance sheet can carry and together with the equity support. But I think at the end of this, uh, it ultimately comes into um, the amount of revenue one generates because from that revenue, you need to then service your debt service commitments uh, as well as then get to a situation where you can generate enough returns uh, to return to the shareholder in the form of dividends. What we're trying to just highlight here, uh, honorable members, is that in terms of the policy environment, 
firstly, the electricity pricing uh, policy uh, in 2008 that stated ESKIM should, uh, the tariffs should reach cost reflectivity within five years. Uh, and even what we see on the outlook uh, currently, we don't get to that level uh, by 2023. I'll highlight that in some future slides. Uh, it also indicated that the regulator should produce a 10 year price part. And again, in terms of the Electricity Regulation Act, ESKIM must recover its efficient costs and earn a, a fair return or margin. If I, can, if I can move on and I'll come back to the efficient costs uh, later in the slide uh, and, and where the prices are. If we can then move, Natasha, to the next sli uh, slide 12, please. You can skip that, skip that. Uh, stop here, go one back, one back, please. Yeah, uh, honorable chairperson, I think you've highlighted this. This is just uh, illustrating the difference between the applications that ESKIM has made to the regulator from 2014 up until 2022 and what was awarded. And if we just uh, add the difference in terms of the uh, shortfall in revenue over the period, uh, it's just, 350 just, billion. So the CFO, just, just hold, just hold, just hold. Um, uh, Honourable mm -hmm. members and everybody who's in the meeting, mm -hmm. can I can I request that you mute mm -hmm. your your mics? Uh, yeah. The only the only mic yeah. who should be um, active is the CFO's mic. Please, please, everybody who's is is is, is on the platform, just mute, just mute. That's one. Two, honourable members and everybody who's um, who's in the meeting, can you please have you are videos on, right? Uh, you you are live, and, and the people of South Africa would like to see who they are interacting with. Just just no no, just a second. If you have got a problem with a, um, if you have got a problem with a connectivity, then it's understandable. If you are if your video is uh, it, it's off, right? So that's that that would be my my my, my request. If everybody else should have his or her video on mic muted the Chair. On, yes may i just make a request i usually experience connection problems once i switch on my video yeah yeah uh, you, yes mm -hmm. yes sir that's the only reason why i never use it even during the assembly the sittings no no I, I that's 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 understandable that that's why i said if someone yes, is saying if someone is having connectivity problems, it's understandable. Um, Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So, so if, if you are having that, it's quite understandable. Uh, but um, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, sorry, sorry, CFO, to 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 to, to interrupt to interrupt you. Uh, let me let me allow the uh, the CFO to continue, and please bear with us. Just those are the house uh, rules. Thank you so much. Uh, CFO, please proceed. Okay. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, I've, I've explained this slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? I think what 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 we are highlighting in this slide, uh, Honorable Members, we know that since 2008 to 2019, the cumulative increase in the average price of electricity through the tariff adjustments has been about fivefold. Uh, we, we just want to highlight during that same period, Eskom's debt amount on its balance sheet, you will see that has increased from slightly below 50 billion rand in 2008 to where we found ourselves at the end of 2019, around 440 billion rand worth of gross debt. I think that's an important point to highlight, and I'll try to uh, uh, explain the link when we get to to the future slides if we continue colleagues uh natasha to the next slide yeah the, i think this is an important slide uh honorable members what i want to highlight here is that the actual return on assets that iskim has achieved during this a period of 2014 to 2019 and we're busy with the 2020 financials 
you can see that it's basically hovering around 0%. Uh, and then when we make the losses, it goes below uh, the 0%. M more importantly, uh, that you, what you will find that in the NASA decision of, of the multi-year price determination four, that after NASA has adjusted for the 23 billion support uh, that you've appropriated, the effective returns also get below zero. And what we're saying here, yeah, Chairperson, this does not allow ESKIM the opportunity to generate enough cash to cover its cost of capital. If I then move on uh, to the next slide. Uh, all, all, all we're doing here is to just highlight that the, the price of electricity is currently sitting on this dotted line, whereas previously when NERSA provided a longer term price part, the cone of acceptable, the lower and upper band was between 100 cents to 100 and all the 30 cents. And in previous uh, multi-year applications, what we found is institutions like BUSA, EIG, EIUG, as well as the IRP have indicated that the price of electricity should be anywhere between 108 cents to 118 cents. And where we currently are at the end of 2019, uh, uh, at this 80 odd cents level, you can see the gap uh, which creates uh, cash flow pressure for ESKIM. Uh, Chairperson, if we move to the next slide, I think it shows it a bit better. Yeah, just to highlight, you will see in our submission we've made, according to ESKIM, we've calculated the gap of the price of electricity to be in the region of 25% between where we find ourselves at the end of MYPD 4 in tw uh, constant 2020 uh, RANs of 100 cents per kilowatt and all the previous indications from IRPs have said this is anything between 120 to 140 cents. What we are highlighting here, Chair, this is the migration that needs to be closed to get contribute to ESKIM sustainability. I think it's appropriate for me, although I've not included in the slides, uh, person and, and members to talk about ESKIM's cost base. It is in our uh, detailed submitted document. Uh, if I just talk on the total primary energy cost uh, on a compounded average growth rate basis, it increased from 2014 of about 70 billion rand to 2019 of 100 billion rand. That gives you an average compounded growth rate of 7.4% over the period. Uh, and if we look at our operating costs and maintenance, which includes employee benefits, that has grown chairperson from 46 billion in 2014 to 52 billion. That average uh, compounded growth rate is 2.4%. What has ESKIM also done during this period, especially the last three years, We've looked at our capital expenditure and as we approaching the end of the new build, which our colleagues will touch on later, uh, our average capital spend in the initial period was averaging around 55 billion per annum and it peaked at about 60 billion in 2017. Since 2017, uh, Chairperson, that 60 billion in 2018, we spent 48 billion on capital expenditure. In 2019, we spent 34 billion. And for the last financial year, uh, unaudited number is 24 billion, which shows that from an ESKIM's perspective, we've reduced our capital expenditure significantly. We've kept our operating costs and maintenance relatively flat in line with inflation increases and primary energy although slightly above uh, inflation, was tracking 7.4% in total. Okay, person, if I then move on uh, in the interest of time, next slide. 
just to highlight from an overall electricity price, a survey that was done by the Statista in 2018 reflects Eskom's price on the lower end there as well as South Africa. Uh, the difference between the two, one is obviously at a Munich level and one is at an Eskom level compared to the other countries in that uh, survey. Uh, if I move on, Chairperson, the next slide. Uh, and similarly, uh, a World Bank report that was done in 2016, specifically focusing on 39 sub-Sahara Africa countries, shows that Eskom at the lower end in terms of the price of electricity compared to other countries in, in Africa. Then, Chair, I think two more slides from my side. Slide 22, just to bring uh, the committee up to speed in terms of, uh, if we move on, Natasha, thank you. Uh, around carry on, 22, carry on. Next one, yep, yep, stop here, go one back. Thank you, one back, yep. Chairperson, you will recall uh, and the members that ESCOM has reviewed uh, the recent decisions of the regulator around the regulatory clearing accounts and the decision that was uh, ordered in ESCOM's favor by the judge for the years 2015 to 2017. Uh, our understanding in an application uh, says that we don't believe that NASA had applied the methodology correctly for the RCAs, which totals some um, 26 billion for that period. Person, we've also made a submission uh, for 2018, totaling 14 billion. That this uh, court has not yet uh, sat on the 14 billion decision. But just to highlight that the principles of the 2018 review are exactly the same as 2016 uh, to 17. Uh, one more point to highlight on this slide. Um, in terms of the RCA application and when a decision is made, ESKIM then recovers that at the future point in time. This just indicates the, the difference in years between when the costs were incurred and when the recovery happens in uh, NASA's determinations of, of liquidations. And you could see it varies between three to six years uh, based on historical decision. Uh, Chair, if you allow me, I think an important point for the members to understand, through the regulatory process, ESKIM does not recover the time value of money. So these costs that we basically borrowed in these shortfalls in these years, we were funding it through borrowings Although we recover from a regulatory mechanism the absolute differences that are deemed efficient, there is no allowance for the time value of money and the cost of borrowing. If I then move on, uh, Natasha, you can skip all of this. Uh, the only other point, you can continue, Natasha. Slide. Uh, I think you can go to, yeah, I think you can stop here at the conclusion. A person, there's also the 69 billion, uh, the equity support. Uh, we know the decision was uh, in Eskom's favor. However, NASA uh, has decided to appeal the, the, that decision, and we will wait for the process to unfold. I think, Chair, uh, I think the important points to highlight here, we, we've demonstrated that we believe that the, the price needs to go up by around 25% in real terms, but there has to be a transition and a mechanism. Well, we, we understand that it cannot go up uh, you know, once off adjustment uh, and the impact on the economy. However, I think the other important point to highlight here is the importance of the user pay principle uh, and that for government to develop policies to protect vulnerable sectors and vulnerable uh, communities uh, together with the policymakers and, and, and the regulator as part of this migration, that's an important factor to be taken into account. And at the end of the day, um, ultimately, if, if we cannot meet our debt service commitments from the amount that we generate uh, through our operations chair, it leaves ESCOM in a situation where we then approach yourself and the committee and government for support to meet those debt service commitments. 
Thank you, Chair, for your time. I'm, I'm done with my section. Yeah, yes, uh, CEO, uh, continue to attend. Uh, Honorable Chair, uh, thank you very much. If I can now ask uh, Dan Mashiko, who um, up until very recently was looking after uh, coal purchases to uh, deal with the next section, please. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, uh, Oral members. Uh, I'm battling to see the presentation, so I'm going to follow on, on my screen and, and I will highlight on which slides uh, I am. I, I have really acute uh, connectivity problems, Chair. So I'm afraid if I turn on the video, I may actually lose the entire, you know, like a connection. Okay. So, Natasha, the first slide is, is basically slide number 30. Uh, a chair in line with the conditions that were set uh, on the special appropriation, we we undertook an exercise to review all our coal contracts, and in doing that, we basically developed a model that looks at the bottom-up cost of mining per individual mine and contract, and and based on that, we compared that to to the price that we were paying, and the difference is basically what we deem as uh, as a profit margin that the different miners are, are making. The arm in industry norms and people that were outside the industry norms is are uh, the seven suppliers that chair we identified where we needed to go and and renegotiate and and indeed we we've undertaken that particular you know like exercise because we deemed that the the higher profit margin that we they were making it's it's not justifiable and we approached these suppliers uh, on individual basis uh, however in response you know when the counter proposed uh, uh, to our proposal to reduce the costs, they they basically wanted ESCOM to open up all the uh, you know like a contract. Some of them have historical contracts which are uh, in ESCOM terms very favorably priced, and they still have a lot of you know like a volume to go. And and that's basically where they they were coming from. And and some other suppliers saw an opportunity to basically increase their volume supply you know like a, to ESCOM using you know like a, this particular process. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move on, uh, Natasha, to, to, to the next slide, which is slide 31 of the deck. Uh, it's, it, Chair, it's just to give a background that uh, over and above the reduction or the attempt to reduce the contracted prices, especially for those contracts we contracted in, uh, in 2018 or financial 2019, when we were in emergency procurement, we also optimizing our inventory holding by, by uh, making sure that we, tem we the tempo of our supply is optimum. And this is in lieu of, you know, like the, the low energy, you know, like a, a demand and, and also our plant not uh, performing, you know, quite well. So we are basically seeing our stock levels sitting at a very high level above what, you know, like a uh, ESCOM prescribes. You know, ESCOM prescribes overall system 33 days. We're currently sitting around 60 days, and the grid code requires us to keep 20 days. So as ESCOM, we keep, uh, I think, more stock than what the grid code requires. So we optimize, you know, like the stock, because we don't want to sit with a lot of, you know, debt capital as working cost uh, on the stockpile. So in, in reducing the call volumes, you know, like a, it, it, it's also it also became a, a, a complexity when we negotiating because suppliers wanted, you know, like a, to increase supply uh, to, to, to ESCOM and they wanted, you know, like uh, that part to be, you know, like uh, to be, uh, uh, to be addressed before they can, uh, they can negotiate. And out of the seven suppliers that were identified through our uh, internal process, uh, I think we only had one successful, you know, like outcome uh, from this process and that particular offer from the supplier, uh, you know, we expecting savings of about, you know, like 127 million rands. It is currently going through our approval process because it, it does entail expansion of the contract, which has to be approved internally in ESCOM by board, and then it must also go to National Treasury. But the process is underway. And Chair, the, the next two slides are basically giving a summary uh, per supplier. You know, you can see supplier one, uh, we have six contracts with them, and and they were not uh, also willing, you know, like uh, to deal with individual contracts, which we highlighted you know, like uh, they wanted to deal with other, you know, like uh, historical contracts, uh, longer term contracts we have with them, which are favorably priced. And, and their pricing offer uh, on that basically would have meant you would give them a, a price increase 
on a lower base contract with a lot of volume to get a, a, a small benefit on very short term contracts, which some of them will be expiring in six months. And ESCOM becomes, you know, like a, a cash cash negative over, you know, like the period of the total portfolio, you know, like a combined. So it was not presenting, you know, like a savings opportunity uh, to ESCOM, and which is why we could not move beyond, you know, like a uh, uh, our proposal and their proposal. And the second supplier chair, uh, similarly, you know, like a, they offered, you know, like a, a, an increase. However, they wanted, you know, like an additional contract tenure, which which is three years, and and that three year additional contract tenure and the and and the ten percent reduction, you know, like a, on an ESCOM cash basis, you know, like it would have resulted in a contract expansion of about two hundred eleven percent. And you know, like a, what we are seeing is that, uh, you know, it does not give us the type of savings that justify or which justify, you know, like a adding, you know, like a three years, you know, like a on the supply, whereas we are seeing, you know, like a very low demand, you know, so adding additional coal on an already, you know, like a oversupply, you know, like a ESCOM portfolio for the next two years, you know, like a, it, it basically, you know, like it's not helping and it's not presenting a, a cash positive, you know, like a, uh, a situation. The third supplier chair, you know, like a, uh, uh, similarly, you know, like a, uh, they they wanted, you know, like us to increase the uh, monthly contract uh, offtake, and and also increase, you know, like uh, the 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 total volumes, and basically no major, you know, like a, a savings we were achieving, and the contracts basically are also close, you know, like uh, to 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 expiring. I'm gonna move on to slide 33, which is the last slide on on my deck. Uh, and, and the fourth supplier, you know, like a, uh, the offer received was about a 4% price reduction on two contracts. And and also they wanted us to enter into new contracts with them as part of the process. And their proposal is chair is, is, is quite uh, problematic. I mean, it, it goes outside, outside the confines of uh, uh, the preferential procurement framework. And it will also not be fair to other suppliers who are potentially looking at uh, supplying as form through a, a competitive bid. And the 4%, you know, like a proposal was way below what, you know, like a, our, you know, like a, a aspiration as ESCOM is. And, and you know, like a 40 million tons to be added, you know, like a uh, for a 4% price reduction, you know, like a, it did not make business sense for ESCOM. Whereas we are seeing uh, very good prices from our open tender process we've run at are not to Tuka, you know, like in other stations. And, and so, you know, from a cash uh, outflow perspective and savings, you know, like a, it, it is cheaper for us to enter into the new contracts and allow these other ones to expire, you know, like in a short period of time and not enter additional, you know, like a, a, a coal contracts. Okay, so supplier for uh, uh, chair, you know, like uh, the, the savings opportunities are currently uh, being being explored. Uh, they they have other you know like a, a tenders which they've offered through the Kusile, you know like a RFP. The the savings opportunities uh, uh, implementation is basically you know like a uh, based on us you know like a reducing logistics cost, and and the option basically is to collapse the high priced you know like a existing contract and enter into the new contract which came through the uh, the procurement you know like a process and that's basically what we are negotiating and we hopefully you know like it will succeed with that yeah and supplier six chair you know like a uh we, we could not achieve any savings you know like a similarly to to the other suppliers where they wanted you know like a additional you know like a, a monthly offtake you know for a very minimal uh, uh uh savings which basically creates higher cash requirements and i mean our problem is not only cost it's also cash so we look at both, you know, like a scenarios, you know, like which gives us the, the best positive, you know, like outlook and we where we did not, you know, like a, uh, succeed. And Supplier 7 who also has one contract with us, you know, like a, they also wanted, you know, like a, a, a an increase on their monthly contractual volume uh, before they can, you know, like a, engage with us, you know, like a, for, uh, I, I just picked up some background noise, chat, sorry about that. Uh, so we can engage with them. So in a nutshell, chair, I think supplier four is basically, you know, where we we are intending to finalize and get the savings 
you know, by transition from a current contract and entering into a new contract, we came through the procurement process. And most of these other contracts here are, are quite short term and they were deliberately entered into short term. Uh, in 2018, you know, like uh, when we had an acute coal shortage to buy us time to uh, implement our long term strategy, which is currently uh, underway. And since then, Chair, I think we've been to the market with about five RFPs for more than 250 million tons. And some of them are in evaluation and the Arnold one was big. It's almost, you know, like a complete chair. That's that's it, uh, Chair Andre. Yeah, that's the last on my deck. Um, Honourable Chair, thank you very much uh, to Dan. Um, if I can take slide 34 as read, uh, dealing with the declarations of interest, suffice to say that um, the declarations of interest at senior level management is, uh, as we should expect, and for the board also 100%, um, some of our uh, more junior employees have had issues to complete the online declaration of interest but even there, the uh, progress is uh, satisfactory under the circumstances. I'm now going to ask uh, our Group Executive Human Resources, Ms. Elsie Pule, to uh, briefly take us through some of the people issues that were raised. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning to the members. If we can go to slide 35. Um, Chair, I will use my slides so that I don't waste the committee's time. So when you go to slide 35, uh, in the last 12 months, we implemented two levers uh, in terms of addressing uh, the issue of filling our critical vacancies. One of the levers was we were relinking the resources from your head office and support functions to the divisions. Uh, to make sure that the divisions have full accountability in terms of their mandates. We also had a once-off project, which was approved as a special dispensation to fill the critical positions, particularly in transmission, generation, uh, distribution, and um, ERI. So if you go to slide 36, this is just to give the committee an indication of the ESCOM workforce profile. Um, ESCOM company employs about 37,000 employees. Um, at ESCOM, Rotec industry are subsidiary. We've got about 6,008, uh, giving us a total complement for the group of 44,000 employees. Um, about um, th uh, 13, 33% are female and um, about 87% uh, are black employees. And we're also showing you a breakdown in terms of occupational levels. You will see that the majority of our employees are in the skilled and the semi-skilled categories. Uh, in the managerial and professional areas, we've got about 6,500 employees. Our attrition stands at about 3.6%. We've also shown the committee here a breakdown in terms of uh, our employees in the provinces, as well as a breakdown in terms of age. Uh, just to give an indication in terms of our age profile, more than 40% of our employees are under the ages of 35. So if you go to slide uh, 37, uh, we're just giving an update in terms of uh, how many people had been relinked from the head office functions to the divisions. That is just under uh, 9,000 employees chair, and we have completed the process um, of relinking those resources, and we believe that um, at this point, relatively, we are sufficiently resourced to fulfill our mandate. And the next few slides, I won't go into them, is just a detailed breakdown of showing uh, where the people moved from and where they have uh, been allocated to. If you go to slide 39, um, we're also showing a breakdown in terms of our personnel. Uh, we're showing uh, um, personnel in terms of categories, how many operators we have, technicians, artisans, etc. because the question was also raised in terms of uh, we might not be having sufficient resources where we need them. So that we're showing the breakdown. And we're also showing the breakdown over the past few years to also um, address the issue of we had lost a lot of people over time. If I can use the first line on slide 39, Chair, uh, just to show in terms of your technical, if I show the first line, technical official, 
um, you will notice that in 2013, we had about 7,200 employees. And in July, we're sitting at 6,600. So in line with our attrition and in line with our efficiencies as well, we don't believe that that will be a crisis. In other areas, you might find there had been higher attrition. And those are some of the areas we had addressed through the special dispensation um, that we implemented last year. So um, basically, Chair, that's um, our, our, our presentation in terms of addressing the issues of um, the skills and resources at ESCO. I'll end there, Andre. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsie. Um, Honorable Chair, I'm now going to hand over to our Chief Procurement Officer, uh, Mr. Soli Tichangano, to deal briefly with slide 43. Thanks, um, Andre, Chair, and, and members. I will not put my video on because my connectivity is also uh, giving me a problem. The slide that um, Andre referred to is the uh, review of contracts that uh, identified and, and renegotiated. Um, similar to what then was the reporting on the seven suppliers, we also engaged a, a number of suppliers to ensure that we can get uh, some savings. But what we are showing on slide 43 are the uh, difficulties that uh, we are experiencing as 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 uh, as as come because suppliers are demanding more volumes and and if we give more volumes outside the preferential procurement then we will experience what Dan was also referring to that they will be contravening the uh, preferential procurement uh, um, regulations but however we are continuing with other efforts to ensure that we can um, save um, some additional money for ESCOM as the presentation from the CFO has indicated that uh, we are uh, bleeding from uh, ESCOM side, therefore we need additional uh, savings. Uh, thanks, uh, Andre. Uh, thank you, Solly. Uh, Honourable Chair, we are then moving on to slide 45. Um, Mr. Maharaj, who is the project director for the Kusili project, will take us uh, through these slides. Good morning, Chairman, uh, Deputy, Deputy Minister and members of the committee. Uh, I want to blame the weather today for the poor connectivity because I'm also experiencing intimate, intermittent uh, uh, connectivity issues, Chairman. So with your indulgence, I will talk through the slides as put forward uh, and uh, controlled by Natasha. Uh, Chairman, in terms of the uh, question and the query posed by the committee, uh, there was clarity being sought with respect to the contractors that have been uh, overpaid. So I've listed the key and the major contracts that are being investigated from uh, at Kusile, uh, these being ABB South Africa, there is a single contract in place with them. Uh, Tenova Mining and Minerals, the project has three contracts in place with that company. Uh, tubular Construction Projects, there are two contracts. And Stefanuti Stocks, uh, Basil Reed and Stefanuti Stocks, Izazi JV, those are two uh, separate contracts. Uh, the first four contracts that I've listed, uh, Chairman, are being investigated through uh, the SIU and the NPA. Uh, and in terms of the progress, they are still uh, with specialist uh, forensic planners and forensic cost engineers uh, determining the quantums, the exact quantums. Uh, 
the SIU has fed back that they have consulted with and briefed uh, their senior counsel on each of these matters. Uh, to date, uh, there's been one uh, particular case or one contract where there have been arrests. Uh, that is the investigation into the matter with tubular construction projects. Uh, Natasha, next slide, please. I will then share a little bit more detail, uh, Chairman. Uh, specifically with respect to ABB, there are two key matters that are being investigated. Uh, the first matter that's being investigated is the uh, at the time of the award of the uh, contract to ABB, uh, there were dates that were uh, utilized uh, that disqualified a supplier and motivation to award to ABB specifically. Uh, so that is a forensic planning exercise that is being undertaken uh, to, to actually uh, prove that particular claim as to the award being uh, potentially irregular. During uh, 2016 and 2017 as well, Chairman, uh, there were four major variation orders that were issued to the supplier. Uh, so it goes back uh, to February 2016 and the last being in February, uh, October 2017. Uh, and the sum total of these is just a little over a billion rand. Uh, the investigations are, are progressing again from a forensic quantification perspective because the substantiation documentation and the records for these particular variations are either not present or very, very sketchy at best. Uh, Moving on, Natasha, to slide number 47. Uh, this deals with uh, Tenova. Uh, again, on this particular um, contract, we are dealing with an estimated value of 735 million rand, uh, where there was a settlement uh, during March 2016 and January 2017. Uh, the particulars to assess and verify the delays and the costs claimed is what uh, the SIU is probing and investigating before uh, formalizing the charges that will be put forward to the courts. Uh, slide 48, Natasha, please. With respect to tubular construction, uh, there are two uh, contracts. And it is in this particular contract where arrests have been made uh, last year in December and uh, the cases are ongoing. Uh, there is an additional investigation uh, being undertaken by the SIU because this contract stemmed out of what is uh, commonly known as a descoping. So there was a descoping exercise undertaken with GE, the contractor origin originally contracted to uh, build the air-cooled condensers at Kusile and uh, this was then subsequently awarded to Tubular. Uh, so both sides, the awarding of the work to Tubular uh, and the payments made to Tubular as well as the descoping exercise with GE are being investigated. The second Tubular contract on slide 49 uh, deals with our wastewater treatment plant. Again, this was a descoping exercise where the original uh, contract was awarded to Mac Mott McDonald PDNA and then later descoped and awarded to Tubular. So these investigations, like I mentioned, have uh, are underway and being substantiated in terms of the quantums. Slide 50, please, Natasha. <clears throat> Dealing with Stefanuti stocks, Basil Reed, uh, commonly referred to as Package 16 at uh, Kusile. Uh, during 2015, up until the end of 2018, uh, there were payments made to the contractor uh, in, with respect to a settlement agreement. Uh, very, very inconsistent in terms of the actual payments made uh, during that period of time. Very, where uh, P's and G's or preliminaries in general had varied between 15 and 50 million rand per month. Uh, the project director that took over in 2018 put a stop to all of those interim agreements uh, and payments 
and the SIU is quantifying uh, these uh, values as well. Slide 51 deals with Stefanuti Stocks, uh, Izazi JV. Uh, this particular contract was terminated. There were a number of disputes and claims put forward by the contractor, which have been uh, refuted and disputed by Eskom. And the particulars for these claims are being investigated and quantified by the SIU. Slide 52. Uh, deals with other uh, contracts in place at Kusile. These particular contracts are being reviewed uh, and investigated internally by Eskom's Audit and Forensic Department, and uh, the investigations there are uh, underway. There are areas within these investigations where the assistance of the SIU is being sought uh, so that we could pursue civil claims against uh, uh, the former employees as well as the companies that are implicated in that. Chairman, I've added in slide 53, and I think this is purely to clarify there are two very different matters being dealt with. Uh, Natasha, next slide please, 53. Uh, commonly reported in the press, uh, there is the issue around the uh, overpayment around the 4 billion rand as well as a 5 billion rand that is associated with a separate claim uh, that Eskom has lodged against Tegeta, and this is for uh, non-delivery against the contract that was in place with Tegeta at that point in time. So the distinguishing, it's important to distinguish between uh, the 4 billion rand potential overpayments at Kusile versus the 5 billion rand claim that's been lodged lodged with the business re rescue practitioners uh, with respect to Tegeta. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I will also deal with, very, very briefly, uh, there is a lot of detail that has been supplied as part of the report uh, with respect to the question raised around the uh, Kusile and Medupi power plant cost uh, increases, overruns, uh, and the first few slides deal with the historic uh, matters in terms of uh, the decisions around ESCOM being allowed to actually uh, construct the, the new power plants. Uh, albeit, the, the, the key takeaway is that the delays in the decisions to actually execute these particular projects put put Eskom on the back foot in terms of not allowing adequate time in terms of planning and the front end engineering and design that's required on large uh, build programs or, or uh, capital uh, projects of this nature. Uh, Natasha, moving on to slide 56 and 57. Chairman, I've tried to summarize in these two particular slides, and I will not go through them, uh, but it provides a, a high-level summary with respect to uh, the cost overruns uh, for both Medupi and Kusile, and it also deals with some of the issues that Eskom, or measures that Eskom has implemented in terms of trying to curb uh, these cost overruns. Slides, slides 58 and 59, uh, just provide the benchmarks uh, for both Medupi and Kusila from a time perspective as well as a cost perspective. And again, it contrasts the front end engineering and design that's required for capital projects of this nature versus the reality that Eskom was play, uh, faced with uh, once the decision for Eskom to execute these projects was finally given. Uh, so slide 58 provides the cost, uh, the, the, the schedule benchmarks, while slide 59 provides the cost benchmarks for um, both uh, Medupi and Kusile as compared to uh, international benchmarks as well. I'll not go into the detail, the numbers are there as well as in uh, the report uh, provided. I'm going to skim through 
from slide 60, Jim. Um, and this elaborates a little bit more on the key drivers for the cost movements, cost escalations, and in many cases, the underestimations made. Uh, so in terms of the setup and development, uh, the the pressure to actually bring on the new bring the new capacity online uh, did not assist the teams in terms of uh, adequate time for front end engineering and design the that was required. Uh, slide sixty one uh, highlights the fact that the actual execution of the projects started without there being a firm design uh, in place and in, in the same breath trying to meet a very, very fast-tracked schedule. Um, at that point in time, Eskim had accepted that responsibility not to uh, 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 belabor that point and, 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 and get uh, the projects moving. Uh, we also have went through the strategy of multiple contracts. Uh, so the upfront integrated schedule uh, was very, very disjointed which subsequently leads to additional claims and movements from one contract to the other just adds costs uh, to the to the project overall. Uh, contractor expertise at the time that uh, the contracts for both Medupi and Kusili were awarded uh, was also very much in short supply. Uh, at the time of awarding the Medupi and Kusila projects, uh, the number of uh, capital projects in the energy sector were at an all-time high and uh, the expertise uh, required to, 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 to execute not freely available and hence uh, the premiums paid as a result of that supply demand uh, in the market. Natasha, moving on to slide 62. Uh, project integration uh, with the multi a contract strategy that Eskom pursued. Uh, integration uh, is a major, major issue, which at the time was not fully understood nor catered for. Uh, the lack of this integration in, in uh, contracting uh, strategy uh, has uh, led to a large um, the quantum in terms of the cost overruns experienced at uh, both Medupi and uh, uh, Kusile. Both projects also experienced a large number of force measure type strikes uh, for various reasons. And collectively, uh, on each of the sites, almost 24 months in terms of the delays uh, as a result of these. Uh, contract performance and productivity. Uh, key issue that has uh, cost both projects uh, additional money. Natasha, moving on to slide 63. I think I've covered this, uh, Chairman, in terms of... Uh, next slide, please, Natasha. As I mentioned to... On slide 63, we cover the issues around the um, yeah, lack of the competent uh, or insufficient uh, supply in terms of the market and Eskom being left with uh, contractors with resource con constraints. Uh, both projects also took on a strategy to partner with uh, multinational engineering companies. Uh, for a long time, the integration between Eskom resources and these uh, multinational engineering companies uh, was not uh, satisfactory in terms of lots of duplication of effort and a lack of understanding of the ESCOM and country requirements in terms of governance that led to uh, uh, there not being a common uh, understanding of how to execute. Uh, slide 54, Jim, uh, the latest uh, in the last sort of two to three years uh, with respect to investigations into the corruption, uh, they need to, to, to proceed, but these also lead to delays where the integration uh, effort when a single contractor uh, stops working or is not able to work, 
uh, that leads to on costs and or delays with other um, contractors as well. So uh, in as much as we are rectifying uh, the, uh, the fraudulent activities, uh, these do cause other impacts in terms of the projects themselves. We've also seen a large number of companies go into business rescue and the financial stability. Uh, in terms of these, we have large gaps in terms of the project where contractors are no longer able to fulfill their obligations and these subsequently lead to delays with the contractors that follow on from that work. Uh, and in terms of the ESCOM processes, in terms of uh, filling that gap, uh, it could take anything between 9 and 24 months before uh, new contractors are engaged and uh, working on site. And like I say, these just leads to there being additional costs and or time delays with the subsequent or follow-on contractors. So in terms of slides 65, 66 and 67, I will... Um, uh, not go through them in detail, but it provides the uh, the reasoning and some of the uh, risk mitigation measures that we have put in place at both the, pro the, the, the projects. Um, the last two slides deal with where the costs are currently, which is slide 68, uh, Natasha. For both uh, Medupi and Kusile, uh, the costs that are indicated there at 145 and 161.4 billion rand respectively uh, have not uh, changed since 2015, which is when the last time the, the overall business cases for uh, the projects were reviewed. Uh, all indications that we will complete these projects uh, within those approved, uh, currently approved budgets that we have in place, Jim. The last slide deals with the commercial operation status of each of the projects. Um, as you will see that at Medupi, uh, Unit 6 all the way down to Unit 1 uh, are in commercial operation and it's expected that the last unit, Unit 1, will go into commercial operation uh, first quarter of next year. At Kusile, we have one unit that is in commercial operation and Units 2 and 3 will be done uh, within this uh, current financial year. At Kusile specifically, we are experiencing problems with Unit 3 currently. Uh, we are dealing with uh, those issues. Um, they are major technical issues that we are resolving, but we still have uh, the forecast that we will have Unit 3 into commercial operation within uh, this current financial year from an ESCOM perspective. Seven, uh, that brings me to an end. I do see that I've maybe taken seven minutes more than was allowed. Thank you. Thanks, Avin. Thanks, um, Honorable Chair, with, with your permission, I know we are over time. Um, if we can quickly run through the remainder of the slides before we hand back to you, just to do a time check, please. Yeah, that's 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 fine. Uh, let, let 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 me give you up to Corapas and uh, uh, CO, please uh, end at Corapas, eh? so that right. uh, thanks allow, uh, the, allow the members to also interact with the presentations. Thank you, Jay. We'll we'll speed it up. Um, so uh, just on the on the following slide, there, um, Jay, slide seventy one. Uh, we are uh, investigating. Uh, 39 different contracts uh, with significant cost overruns and uh, we will in due course report back to the committee uh, on those issues. If I may now hand over to uh, our uh, Chief Legal Counsel, Mr. Bartlett Hewu, who will take us through the um, cost recovery uh, update. Bartlett? Honorable Chair, Honorable Deputy Minister, uh, Honorable Members of the Committee, I will take slides 76 to 80 as read in the interest of time. I will be ready to field any questions that members may have. The only thing that I wish to highlight is the recent 3.8 billion rand 
claim that ESCOM and the SIU have made against uh, former executives of ESCOM, board members, and also uh, Tageta Exploration and Resources, owners the, the Guptas. We are busy with the SIU, as you would have heard from Mr. Maharaj and the GCE, with other continuing investigations in the background. We will be coming back to the committee with a revised uh, report uh, detailing the actions taken uh, of, of, uh, towards recoveries. Thank you, Honorable Chair. CEO. Thank you very, very much, Bartlett. Uh, I will now hand over to Mr. Rulani Matabula, who is our... Um, yes, Honorable Chair. Um, if I may hand over to Mr. Rulani Matabula, who is our Acting Group Executive for Generation, to deal with the load shedding issue. Thanks, uh, Andre. Um, Honorable Chair and uh, the members of the committee, for, for the sake of time, allow me to, to quickly uh, go through this uh, feedback that we have submitted to you. Just an overview of on the July and August uh, recent load shedding that we had. Um, we experienced around uh, 4,000 megawatts loss, which was mainly uh, due to uh, trips at our different plants. Uh, we also had uh, an impact due to the unavailability of our Camden power station, which had to be taken off due to unavailability of ashing space. Uh, we also at the time had uh, Quebec uh, unit number two off, um, and we also had three units um, at uh, one at Midupi and one two at Kusile, which were not available uh, to support the grid at the time. Uh, the, we also needed to manage our reserves uh, very well um, at the time, and uh, that combined uh, had a huge impact on uh, on on our uh, supply. Um, to to manage time, uh, if you look at uh, slide number 82 just an outlook of uh, how how the system looks from July. 2020 uh, to March 2021, you would realize that uh, our demand uh, uh, and our available capacity shows that we will uh, be constrained uh, for, for, for the near future, uh, for the months that we have indicated there. And if you continue on slide 83, it shows the, the same constraint continuing uh, from April 2021 to March 22. Uh, but showing uh, a recovery on, on available uh, capacity. Just to quickly talk to uh, how we're dealing with this thing and going into the future, uh, on our conclusion, uh, you would realize that uh, the focus is mainly on the unplanned load loss uh, to keep it way below the, the 11,000 uh, megawatts, also to maintain our diesel uh, supply, and also to bring back the the units uh, or to reliability at Midupi and Kusile, as my colleague has alluded. The good news is that we have already started bringing back uh, the units that we have taken off at uh, Camden. So that will help in uh, supporting the grid and minimizing the, the impact uh, of load trading going forward. There's a lot of work that we, we have put in place currently to ensure that uh, we maintain our our plant uh, based on our reliability maintenance plan and that will uh, give us the assurance that we need uh, to keep uh, to, to meet the demand uh, going forward chair um, i'm trusting that uh, the rest of the detail um, it's at your disposal and has been read and i would like to end it here thank you CEO. CEO. Thank you very much, uh, Rulani. Uh, Honourable Chair, in the interest of time, if I may, um, yes, yes, Honourable Chair. 
Yeah. No, I was saying, um, uh, um, please, Rep- yeah, no, I was saying it was quiet. And I was saying, um, Rep- we, we, um, I think in the interest of time, um, can, can, can conclude the presentation here. Yeah. Okay. Um, on, um, Honourable Chair, if we can take the remainder of the presentation, which deals with Eskom's contribution to broad-based black economic empowerment, take that as read. Uh, we'd be happy to take any questions that the, com- that the committee might have on that, but uh, we are trying to respect the time contract, so um, let's, let's take that as read and uh, hand back to you. Uh, and thank you again for the opportunity, uh, Honourable Members and Honourable Chair. Um, uh, uh, Prof, anything before we, we come in? Uh, D, DM? Yeah, uh, I'm trying to unmute myself. I, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I think we've given you a snapshot as to the challenges and the opportunities that we have as ESCOM, as, as and we value the support, I think, that you give us as a committee. Not only the support, but the guidance, I think, that you provide, which is necessary as part of a, a democracy, and we value that a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. DM? No, I'm, I'm, Chair, I'm, I'm covered. We may, I may come back uh, if, uh, when members engage, uh, where there are issues, perhaps I, I will then come back at that stage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Tim Eskom. Um, there is, there is, ne- there is a... Um, <clears throat> National Treasury, um, and um, remember, we had an inter- interaction with National Treasury uh, yesterday. I don't know, Ravesh, is there anything uh, pressing from your side you'd like to add? Uh, chair, through you, Chair, um, there's nothing pressing from my side, thanks. But we have a, a, you know, I think we have a separate presentation on the compliance to the conditions, w- which we can do later, if required. But can, to- can, can you summarize in, in, in a minute? Compliance? Uh, Chair, through you, uh, in a minute, um, w- w- what I can do is quickly just uh, just flight this presentation for you, Chair, and I'll just go you t- uh, and just take you through to the main slide, um, which is uh, in terms of the conditions. Basically, um, what we have here is um, we have uh, three conditions that were, you know, that were partially complied. Um, and then there were two uh, you know, conditions that were non-complied with. Uh, you know, in terms of you know, the partial compliance, um, you know, those three uh, you know, conditions, three which relates to the debt and interest uh, you know, payment uh, you know, schedule. Um, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, so it wasn't actually uh, in full uh, or the detail wasn't provided as at the end of March, but um, they have, you know, uh, you know, subsequently uh, did provide, uh, you know, the detail in terms of the uh, full, uh, you know, the payment schedule, uh, you know, over the life of the loans. And then under condition nine, uh, uh, chaired through you, um, you know, in terms of the cost and the, uh, you know, and the timing of, uh, you know, the completion of, uh, you know, Kosila and Madupi, that information now has been provided in the June report. And then uh, would to uh, in a condition 12 uh, I, uh, you know there was a uh, uh, you know uh, you know in, in the uh, you know in the ESCOM presentation uh, then a chair quickly on the non-compliance um, there was uh, two two conditions that were non-complied uh, with, uh, which is the uh, which is condition number six, uh, um, which is in to the disposal of uh, the ESCOM uh, Euro Finance Company, uh, which was a target date of the end of March. Um, uh, so they so they uh, you know they were not able to uh, you know dispose of that, but they are now in the process. Of um, of a you know a new, a new bidding process, and we understand that that target date is now moved to the end of March 2021. And chair, then the last condition that, which was not complied to, which is not complied to, was uh, uh, which was number 16, which was in relation to 
the uh, you know to the implementation of the remuneration standards. I think time for DPE's approval uh, with regards to that. And then, chair, lastly, quickly, if I just go through the uh, you know the, to the proposed conditions for 2021, we have engaged with DPE. We have uh, you know engaged um, with ESCOM on the proposed conditions for 2021. And and uh, and you know and that's been signed off by the uh, you know it, it's been signed off by the Minister of Finance, and um, it has been sent uh, through uh, you know the two committees, which is COA and SECOA. Um, so at the moment, what we have is that ESCOM is reporting, uh, you know, its compliance on the you know on the 1920 conditions until we can then uh, you know have the okay from the two committees to say that they're happy with the conditions for 2021. Yeah, I've summarized it very, very quickly. There were about seven slides, but I think that's, you know, uh, you know, sums it up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ravesh. Please take off your, your presentation from the screen. Thank, thank, thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Ravesh. Um, DM, Chair, CEO, um, a lot of honourable members are, are, are just struggling uh, to, 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 to connect and uh, uh, courtesy of uh, load shedding. Um, so I'm getting, they're just busy uh, 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 calling me here so they can't uh, uh, effectively um, execute their oversight responsibility. So that's how far uh, this load shedding goes. But we'll try. Uh, oral members, uh, I, I, I got some, 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 some messages about some of the oral members who are, who are about to, whose, whose uh, uh, <clears throat> mobile phones or computers are about to die. And I would like to start with them. Uh, I've got Honorable Nklangwini, Honorable Nkwankwa, Honorable Mlenzana. Uh, let's, let's continue then. Matafa. Honorable Matafa. Honorable Sheikh. Dennis Joseph, Chair. Honorable jo Joseph. Honorable Paiso. Honorable Paiso. Peters. Honorable Peters. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's it. Honorable Tangwini, Honorable Kwankwa, Mlenzana, Matafa, Sheikh, Joseph. Paiso, Peters, let's 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 try maximum no no injury time, uh, honourable members. Please time yourselves. It's 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 four minutes and and uh, and let's and let's and let's run. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and unfortunately, I won't be able to even switch on my camera. You have seen how dark it is. Uh, where I'm sitting, so anyway, you won't be able to see it. So I'll look, shoot straight, um, Chair, to some of the overpay, overpayments that was were were done. Uh, um, I think on slide, um, I can't remember the slides because it's 99 slides that we have received. Um, there, uh, there's a one that state um, one, two, three until five, and then number five, various site service contracts not into um, the scope of SIU, um, it's about 180 million. If we can get um, 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 clearance on that, um, uh, what is those contracts and, and over the, um, the contracts of the service contracts. And then also chair, just on the overpaid, um, Contracts um, yet again. I understand that um, some of these cases are with um, law enforcement agency and so forth. Um, but uh, we we need uh, also from from the internal process um, mm. of of ESCOM. How um, far are they with their internal process as well with employers that are still with them? Um, and when by when will these um, cases be wrapped up? Because we are not talking here about 10 rand overpayment, we are talking here about billions. And what measures have been put in place to ensure that this overpayment doesn't happen again, 
with the uh, internal audit process strengthened and all of that. Because it's good and well that you are having uh, the cases with the SIU and all of this other uh, law enforcement agencies, but you within your internal process will also have to strengthen your internal process. So I'd like to know what is the process thereof. Um, and then um, on the, on the, um, to Elsie's slide and the raise um, slide of the 30% uh, uh, of, of Africans, I would just like to maybe perhaps get a total breakdown within which positions are that 33%. Uh, it's all and well, we are having 30% uh, of, of African people in positions, but in which positions are they? And uh, on basically on the top level, one to uh, see that um, it, they are also getting to be your CEOs, CFOs, and all of those things. Um, um, if we can get an, a clearer understanding of that. Um, and Chair, I'm running uh, yeah. a very yeah. fast. Fine. Uh, yeah. Am I still fine? Am I still yeah. fine? Oh. Yeah, still fine. Mm. <laughs> because they are rash a bunch. All right. And then what is the current state of ESCOM's uh, cash flow position taking into account the impact of COVID-19? Uh, what is the amount of debt that was projected to be raised for the 2020-2021 financial year? And how has this number changed due to the impact of COVID on ESCOM's revenue? Uh, and that's all for, for, for me for now, Chair. I will come back when we have you, more you time. Do, oh, and then, seconds. do I still have 30 seconds? Yeah, because, uh, let me shoot to slide 36 then. Um, ESCOM have shown uh, the employment equity achievements, but how does this compare against the et uh, 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 entity's targets? What is the average age of ESCOM employers as age profile reveals that there is a significant number of staff that are in the twilight years and their careers? And how is ESCOM okay. nurturing young talent as part of their succession plans? Thank you, Che. There you go. Thanks. Orobun um, Kwankwa. Yeah. Orobun Kwankwa. Kwankwa, are you there? Orobun Kwankwa, are you there? Okay, Orobun Lenzana, please come in. Orobun Lenzana, please come in. Okay, Orobun Matafa, please come in. Thank you very much, Chair. Greetings to the DM uh, of CEO and the team and those that are from uh, National Treasury. Chair, I will be very, very brief, but maybe just to start on a lighter note. I'm not happy with my lighting because of shading. For, yeah. for me, it's deja vu, because the last time we went to ESCOM for oversight visit, we experienced load shading. <laughs> so I'm experiencing it again. Uh, Chair, maybe let me welcome the presentation and uh, state from the onset that I'm very happy with the detail. It's very detailed. Uh, and also to acknowledge the fact that it is this committee that has called for a forensic audit or a forensic uh, investigation as far as the cost overruns on the build program is, uh, is concerned. Now, a direct question on the overpayments that were uncovered. Are we looking at recovering those particular amounts? Because I hear there was an arrest, there is an investigation, but when the slide where we are looking at the recoveries that we are aiming for, these companies that are identified are not reflecting. The second one, Chair, around overpayments. We have once learned of a three-way invoice verification process that is used in the finance unit of uh, ESCOM. Could this pay overpayments where there are no pure corruption be related to this particular process? And if so, what is the status of this particular process? Are we still using it? And if we are using it, what are the safety nets that have been put around this particular process to ensure that there are no, are no leakages? 
Chair, the third point is on the issue again of um, forensic audit and uh, investigation. The CEO speaks of uh, companies that are red flagged, and I think he gave a number of 39. I'm interested to know, without discussing the merits, <clears throat> pardon me, how are these comp uh, contracts identified? Because, Chair, uh, like I always say, when we account as public reps, we account to constituencies. There is a bedding issue around a case that has a contract that is being cancelled. One, it's an African entrepreneur. Two, it's a woman. And this contract is being cancelled. Uh, it's around the diesel issue. It will be very interesting to clarify the perception around African contracts or contracts that are, have been awarded to Africans being targeted. Hence, I'm asking particularly on the process that is being applied. Now, Chair, uh, maybe it will be proper as well. Once the investigation around the red flag contract is done, ESCOM should report to the committee on the demographics of those particular companies and how do these demographics impact on the triple B EE as well as uh, other transformation uh, programs that, that ESCOM <clears throat> would have uh, implemented. Chair, <clears throat> on the same issue of the contract that is being cancelled, there is subsequently a lot of public debate around the stability and differences in the board of ESCOM with one board member resigning and going public. I just want uh, maybe the DM or the CEO to take us into their confidence on the stability of the board and if whether the board is pulling together. Because in most instances, we have picked up that where the board is not pulling together and there are challenges in terms of top management, all other internal systems collapse because there is no oversight and there is no uh, management intervention where it is required. So it would be important for us to know what is the status of the board and if whether are we happy with uh, the board since one of the um, requirements uh, or conditions rather that we have put for ESCO must to strengthen uh, the board. Uh, let me just check my notes. Uh, Yeah, no, I think for now, Chair, I will, I will, I will pause there. Uh, oh, yeah, no, the last one is on slide 86, Chair. Um, I think it's Honorable Nsanguini spoke on the issue of uh, transformation and localization in terms of contractors that are being uh, deployed to ESCOM uh, programs. Now, on slide 86, there is a statement there that speaks on partnering with the best in the world. It will also be uh, good for the committee to be briefed in terms of what specific measures is ESCOM implementing to ensure that there is assistance for the development of localization as well as procurement and entry uh, for small and medium-sized uh, contractors, particularly those that are owned by Africans, because those are the ones that have been excluded in the historical past of uh, our country, and particularly in ESCOM. Hence, Honorable Ntlanguin is asking on those positions in terms of the role uh, of Africans in uh, management as well as in uh, specialized operations of ESCOM. For now, Chair, I will, I will pause there. Uh, maybe just, uh, just last one. No, no. Uh, yeah. No, no. Uh, done. Gone. Um, gone. Thank you very yeah. much for the opportunity. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Honorable Sheikh. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairperson, and thank you to ESCOM for giving us a very comprehensive report. Gives us a clear understanding of some of the challenges that ESCOM is facing. Um, but I'm also a victim of load shedding, so I don't think I'll be able to stand the test of time, Chair, before the <laughs> meeting is over. <laughs> I may be in darkness. 26 years later, I thought I was coming into light, but I ended up in darkness, but be that as it may. Uh, first question to ESCOM. You speak about electricity theft, which is a major problem in the country, particularly with cables and the theft of electricity. Please tell us what mechanisms you're putting in place to overcome this problem. 
And added to that will be the issue of non-payment, of course, uh, for services that you are providing. Now, what it clearly sh we, we can see here is, is that the loans that you are getting, bailouts from government is being used uh, mainly to pay off debt. So this is not actually sustainable or viable. Clearly what it means is, is that ESCOM is not a viable institution currently. Now, and the reason why I'm, 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 I'm saying this, I have a concern that with the independent power producers that are expected to supply electricity directly through to municipalities, it means, it means there's going to be a, a, a less of a demand from ESCOM. However, your cost and your overhead may remain the same, particularly if you look at the amount of money you're talking about, employee benefits and everything. Now, how is that going to impact you? Because it means you're going to generate less income your overheads and things are going to be the same. Is that not, does that not mean that you're going to get into more serious trouble than you already are? The other thing is I want to know procurement. My understanding is there's been many people that have been enjoying what we call here evergreen contracts from pre-1994. Can you tell us how many of those pre-1994 evergreen contracts exist currently today? or in the last you know, contracts that are 10, 15, 20 years old, who are these people? And whether we're getting value for money based on current uh, market prices. Then we talk about the overpayment of billions of rent. Now the question that arises is, where is your internal audit mechanism and your oversight mechanism? Uh, where is your uh, 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 chief financial officer? And the other, you know, the project directors and project managers and all these people, when these overpayments and things are being made, where are all these people with their own? How many of these people are now going to be paying the price or already being dealt with as a result of the failure to comply or ensure that the finances of ESCOM has been protected? Now, Kusile, can you tell us what was initially... Okay, first of all, it clearly... From your report, it seems like that we did not have the capacity when we thought of this to implement these projects. And that's why we've been running in circles since we announced it. And that has cost us dearly. Now, the question is, what I want to know is the original cost. What do you think it's going to now end up being, despite the figures that you are giving us? Because there's only been delays and delays and delays. And whether you think this thing is going to be completed in due course. Then the question I have in terms of load sharing is in my understanding that there was a project that we were busy with. I think it's somewhere in the Zambian border uh, with DRC and things like that to generate more energy and electric. I, can you just tell us what's happening with them? Then I want to know what, and I'll stop you and say with this last one for now. With all the contracts that we have and the contractors that we are giving out these things, whether it's for supply or services, whatever. What is the percentage uh, of compliance in terms of these contractors and things having the ability or capacity and delivering timelessly and things? Because I'm trying to get a picture of whether we are dealing with people that just do not have the capacity to also provide the services or deliver the goods, but we have to live with them, which costs us more money to escalation and other problems. So I'd like you to, to, to give us that. I'll be okay with it, Chair. I'm not sure if I'll survive for the answers. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, Honorable Joseph. Thank you, um, Chairperson. I just would like to say thank you to the uh, management team, uh, Deputy Minister and the management team, stakeholders for the presentation. Um, my first point I want to make, I didn't hear a lot about state capture or corruption, so I'm not sure if ESCOM is free of that, or the state capture history if ESCOM is part of that. Um, um, the other point I would like to say and ask on slide 5, Chairperson, the draft of pre-ordered cash flow statement um, that is presented to us on, on the slide, um, I would like to know if that figures will it remain the same or if it could change and why, why if it will change, the fact that it must all be audited. On slide 9, um, I know I heard this comment about cost tariff should be cost reflective 
Now, I understand, if I understand that correctly, it's about the expenditure, the income and the profit, which ESCOM should have been at this stage in our democracy, in our history, a profit, but we're giving money to cover dark holes and for survival of ESCOM, which is not good, against the mandate of what ESCOM is there for. Um, so just to clarify that, um, it, uh, then afterwards it was said in slide 13 that the average price increase fivefold versus the debt that is tenfold. Now my question is, um, what does the Constitution say about the provision of electricity at local government level, level and what is ESCOM's responsibility uh, and obligation towards the Constitution? There is clear guidance as to why these, why the entity exists and why local government exists to provide electricity and why ESCOM exists. And I think we need to review that as well. Uh, slide 19, Chairperson. Um, uh, or maybe skip that one and go to slide 24. The, the whole issue between NERSA and ESCOM, I heard that that NERSA was taking into account the appropriations that this parliament has given to ESCOM and then obviously deducted that amounts uh, and then uh, because of that lowered the determination um, as, as 3.9 billion as set in 2018. So and I know there's ongoing cases, but um, it is actually said that that has happened in this in the process. Um, because what's going to happen now uh, on slide 28, where reference was made to um, to the gap or filling the gap, which is 25 percent. The point I need to make: we can't shift that gap to the consumers, chairperson. What is the, what is the restructuring showing us in terms of saving more money for ESCOM? The restructuring process. We haven't heard a lot about that, but the gap of 25% cannot be covered by, by the consumers or, or even business people. Um, I would like to know, Chairperson, who's negotiating on behalf of ESCOM, given the review uh, and the contracts uh, under review? Is ESCOM doing it themselves or are, are they using consultants to review these, con these contracts? Um, then the last point I would like to ask um, uh, Chairperson is a um, uh, point raised by Elsie on slide 35. Uh, I would like to know where the artisans fit in. I saw, I saw, or, or, I mean, I saw a number of 1,800 for artisans. Um, and I would like to know where does the interns, interns um, or internship trainees fit in. And then I saw a figure of 4,085, which is just say other. Now that's a huge, a huge amount. Yeah, that's a huge amount, and I'd like to know where does the pilots fit in that ESCOM um, is also, are they part of that? Um, and then last question, uh, Chairperson, the funding. Um, the completion of, of Madupe and Koshile, I would like to know, do, do, do ESCOM need further funding, uh, approval from, from, from Parliament? And I've heard the figures that they said on the slide, but I would like to know um, if they need further approval, if they're going to come back. And and Thank I saw it after two fifteen years as a project. Yeah, Thank right you. Of, on my overtime. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Orarun Kwankwa, please come in. Orarun Kwankwa. Shame. Uh, uh, he, he wrote to me that he was he was back. It looks like he has been cut. I'm here. Oh no no okay. no! I'm I'm sorry. I forgot to unmute myself this time around, Chair. Okay. Uh, thank thank you thank you very much, Chair. No, I got cut off. Um, you know, it's, uh, connection is a bit of a problem today. I have a few questions. Even my iPad, where I made a lot of my notes, has uh, switched off. It's died. But anyway, I've got my notes here in right right in front of me, Chair. The first question I want to ask Eskom is that perhaps I think time has come for us. Remember when we went on oversight last year, when we first spoke about the overpayments, and then there was a time in the, during the course of this year where no one remembered what these overpayments were about. But I think it's important for us to get a, I don't know whether you can do an age analysis in so far as overpayments are concerned for each individual overpayment uh, to say uh, in future when we get a report to say this is what is happening with ABC, these are the steps undertaken to try and recoup some of the monies, these are some of the challenges. And then we get an indication of how long the process for each one of those companies where we're trying to recoup money, 
how long that process would ideally take so that we're able to monitor it on a regular basis. I think now what is happening is that, yes, the, the companies, as we saw in one of the slides, I actually noted the names are indicated there, but we don't have specific details around what uh, uh, each process is, how far the process is in so far as each company is concerned and what the challenges are. There, there's also, Chairperson, the issue that has to do with, uh, I think, companies that are trying to rip off ESCOM where they are charging uh, the taxpayer exorbitant amounts of money. I think those details where ESCOM is specifically talking about renegotiating some of the contracts and all of those things, maybe also those things, we need details now so that we get to a point where we name and shame companies that continue to try and rip off the, state, the taxpayer because this is the taxpayer's money, it's not their money. Uh, the, the other important issue, there's a slide there, Chairperson, where, uh, where, for example, ESCOM was doing a comparison of, uh, I think, prices, ESCOM prices or tariff, electricity tariffs, with different countries around the world. I, I do feel like that, that, that discussion should be taken further. Because it also doesn't actually take into account those are charging prices that are lower than ESCOM, so that we get a clearer picture of how they made they were able to achieve that. The other critical issue is that with that analysis, it is to a large extent superficial at this point because it does not uh, give us a lot of contextual issues which are important when it comes to country to country. It just looks at the prices. I think we need a detailed analysis so that at some point we're able to make an informed decision to say what is the right way to go. And in fact, it's never a wrong thing if you are cost efficient. If we, so far as costs are concerned, you are efficient and therefore able to make savings that you can pass on to the consumers. It should never be because other countries in the world are charging more than you are doing and you are able to, to, to actually improve efficiency in the system and charge lower prices that we think it's a crime. I read an article recently. Uh, I read an article recently, Chair, that has uh, it's it, it was in one of these financial articles where it was talking about incline block tariff purchases per month, uh, which I think, in my view, we've known this thing happens where uh, the article goes along the lines of saying that for, uh, it, it says it goes according to blocks. If you buy electricity at the end of the at the beginning of the month, it's likely to be cheaper, and if you buy electricity during the course of the month or later on in the month. The price is actually slightly expected to be slightly more. I mean, it's been happening for years, but it would be nice if we can get a, an, an account fi in financial terms. So how does that then impact the financial performance of ESCOM? But the problem with that as well is that it makes the pricing structure very complex for the main industry to understand. It might be that many people are still continuing to buy during the course of the month and therefore are actually wasting a lot of money. Um, giving it into an entity that is not entirely efficient as it were and as we understand it. The, from where I am sitting, the problem of ESCOM is not a low electricity tariff issue. From where I am sitting and the UDM is sitting, the problem here has to do with escalating debt and poor management and issues that have to do with lack of cost inefficiencies. The last question, Chair, I don't want to go into your overtime, is uh, we've been asking, I think it's a, quite, it's a discussion that we've had for a very long time, but I don't think there has been a concrete response to it. Uh, Honorable Sheikh Imam spoke about IPPs, the renewable energy space, to say they are going to start competing with ESCOM. And he's quite right in saying once they start connecting municipalities, as is the policy now, for example, what will happen is that the overhead expenses of ESCOM will remain the same, Right. Uh, which is the cost structure will remain the same, but the revenue will be less. Why is ESCOM not allowed? Or why is ESCOM not having a discussion where it starts playing in the renewable energy space as well? Uh, because the cost in order for one to be able to set up a farm and all these things is lower than doing this whole thing, which costs a lot right. of money. Round up. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Honorable uh, Kaiso. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm not going to be very long. Uh, perhaps we'll take two minutes, and the next two minutes we'll give it to the Chair, I mean, uh, uh, Honorable Dipuo. Uh, let me start here. I'm covered by largely by what Honorable uh, said with regard to the issue of uh, uh, the $4 billion, uh, overpayment. And, and the picture that was uh, outlined during their input. 
Now, I I just want to know to ask this direct question. Uh, uh, in the in the condition, it is mentioned that now, ESCOM did not uh, failed to comply with the disposal of the financial uh, company. But I didn't get it quite clear. What are the reason be uh, behind that? <clears throat> And secondly, is the issue of uh, uh, of uh, remuneration uh, standard, of, uh, yeah, remuneration standard that they did not implement. Uh, I also want to know what is the reason uh, beyond that, because I immediately want to link that question with the. The issue of the performance bonus that uh, that was said that they must stop uh, a, a payment of performance bonus for for their uh, uh, executive managers or s most senior managers there at the company at some stage uh, when we interacted with them. So I just want to know whether did they stop actually that implementation when they are referring to the uh, remuneration uh, standard. <clears throat> now, let me quickly come to this one. Uh, during this year, uh, when we interacted with es with ESCOM, we we once talked about the four billion rand um, that we did not know how did ESCOM pay it out to those uh, uh, contractors. And ESCOM confirmed that there's an overpayment. But then uh, there came, uh, during the uh, uh, process of uh, uh, restructuring at ESCOM, uh, Professor Mahova came in when we were in a meeting, in one meeting, and told us we don't know anything about ESCOM as MPs when we were talking about uh, that, those overpayment. And subsequent to that, there was a, a press statement. There was a, a press statement, perhaps which seek to justify that wrong perception, that we seem not to know anything as, as members of MP, uh, when we talked about uh, uh, what ESCOM told us about during that time. And that statement seemingly seek to, ju to, to justify what Professor was saying that MPs seem not to be knowing anything about ESCOM. Now, would, we, would you be now be in a position to retract and apologize uh, for that uh, utterances in that meeting? Because we take our task uh, as MPs very serious. So we would not be in a position to come and bring uh, lies uh, here in the committee. So we don't we, we don't know what informed that press statement, which we now get in the de some of the details now in this meeting of some of the issues which were raised by, by that press press statement. Now I, I would like I would like you to withdraw that uh, utterances. Uh, over which over were, time, I saw. Statement. Yes, uh, just to sum up, uh, now uh, uh, let me uh, then uh, 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 pause here, Chair. I'll, I'll come back uh, at some stage. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, thanks. Sorry, Honorable Tipu, um, there's, not, there's nothing to be donated to you from Honorable Kaiso. Uh, please, uh, uh, Honorable uh, 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 Peters, come in. I, I was so happy. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Chairperson. Honorable <laughs> Kaiso, you raised my hopes. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Deputy Minister and uh, the uh, Prof, as well as the CEO and officials from ESCOM for the presentation. But Chairperson, I am worried because of time issues. Uh, I just wanted to find out uh, from uh, ESCOM with regard to the one meter uh, or one household one meter uh, campaign with regard to 
the payment uh, 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 culture for services in ESCOM because we, we believed at the time as a committee that that could contribute. But also uh, uh, taking into consideration the impact of COVID on municipalities because households' income has uh, reduced and therefore the rate, uh, I mean, a payment for services has also drastically gone, gone down. How is the payment uh, records for, for municipalities? But in particular, Chairperson, we don't seem to get to know from ESCOM themselves how much business owes ESCOM. And especially business, big business that, that makes money from doing business with ESCOM. We raised this question in the last rounds and, and I, I don't, in the presentations, I didn't get that coming to the fore. Uh, uh, with regard to engagement with suppliers for renegotiations, I want to know why only seven suppliers, because ESCOM suppliers is not uh, only the seven, but also uh, it looks like it's the small fries, the 138 million there and, and whatever. But also, is the, I remember when the committee was talking to the renegotiation of contracts, we were also talking to the evergreeners because there are those big contracts uh, that are still remaining with about 46 years. And I remember myself specifically saying, I can't understand how these contracts were entered into that. Pre, I mean, it, it takes generations into consideration because... If you're still left with 46 years or 49 years, it, it, it's, it's going to take some time. But also, Chairperson, uh, uh, the issue of uh, contracting models for ESCOM has been raised for many years. And it doesn't look like ESCOM is really uh, uh, ready to uh, uh, look at its contracting uh, and project management capabilities. So it's, uh, it's in it's important that we get to know from uh, 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 ESCOM uh, uh, this thing. On slide 39, uh, the HR manager spoke to the headcount and all those others. I just want to find out, why does it look like the engineering capacity in ESCOM gets reduced uh, uh, quite significantly? If you took the slide that shows from the year 2013 up to right now, it shows that the number of engineers have been uh, uh, reducing. With regard to the uh, the four billion rand over payments, and I think uh, Honorable Kaiso has spoken to that. I and Honorable, uh, I think it was Honorable uh, Sheikh who was also speaking to that. I want to know: Is there anyone from ESCOM itself? Who has been held accountable and responsible for this four billion rand overpayment? Because whilst you are engaging with those companies, but it will be important for us to know who has been held responsible and acted upon. Because I would believe that somebody needs to be charged for this a uh, 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 gross uh, 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 incompetence. Because there is no way you can say that you did not see that you are overpaying these particular companies. But also, Chairperson, I want to know from the chair and the CEO, is there any of these companies that you have listed there which were penalized by the Competition Commission for that fraud and corruption that was picked up in the construction cartel saga? Because you would know that there was a construction cartel issue and some of the companies that are also doing business with, with ESCOM were found on the wrong side of the, of the law. I would want to know, is there any one or two or three of those companies that also, again, find them on the list, find themselves on the list of the, 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 those who have been overpaid? Lastly, Chairperson, with regard to the renewable energy a, 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 a program, there was a process many years ago, around, I think around 2013, just before, yes, just after window one, and in preparation for window two and window three, 
There was a, pro- a, a proposal, there was a decision that was encapsulated in, in the Green Economy Accord that actually emphasized the need for ESCOM to contract to companies that are procuring their components. At least each company was supposed to have more than 30% of their components having been manufactured in South Africa. There was much talk about the mirrors, there was much talk about the uh, the, the current uh, uh, inventors, and, and there was quite a number of companies that we're starting to emerge in that particular a, a, a field, especially with the photovoltaic and the solar the, the solar panels, as well as the wind turbines. There, I remember there was a company in the Eastern Cape at Kuha that was doing this. So is it not a requirement that ESCOM actually make it possible that they don't sign any PPA a, 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 or power purchase agreement with a company that does not procure locally for the, the renewable energy build. Thank you, Chairperson. Peter, I can see um, uh, you, 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 you planned for the donation, which never came. Um, <clears throat> um, Darren? 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 Chairperson, yes, Chairperson. Honorable Mlenzana said uh, he couldn't connect, but he was going to send his question to you. Did you get it? No, I haven't received it yet, Chairperson. You haven't received, you haven't received anything. Let me see where I would now. Time it's 11. Let, let, let me try to be uh, quick with my questions. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> can you let me? I'm busy trying to time myself. <laughs> uh, quick, quickly, uh, Chairperson, where's the CEO, COO? Uh, uh, Mr. Oppenhauser, um, because uh, out we have got the new a new CEO and uh, uh, Mr. Oppenhauser. When you interacted with him, uh, you would remember some of these things, right? And uh, I'm, I'm sure this this talks to to the if I may just start there. The question of the four billion rand is not five billion rand. I think it was mistakenly said that, and we corrected in our in, in our statement four billion rand. Uh, DM. Um, Chairperson, this amount was not, it was given to us voluntarily by uh, uh, the SOO that in our investigation we found out that there's a company, not companies, there's a company which has been overpaid by 4 billion rand and we are busy negotiating them and they are also agreeing that they are overpaid and then we were told that they were in the process of, of paying that money back. There was no issue about that. There was no investigation where it has come. So hence, the question keeps on coming. What changed between then and our last in, in, in interaction? Chairperson, there's a matter involving the so oh, Mr. Oppenhauser, where it is, uh, in fact, it's not now alleged because there is a, a, there's even a, a, a <clears throat> the investigation by a, a, a advocate, Kasim, which found that a, a, uh, Mr. Oppenhauser negotiated with a company in which he held shares, right? And it was just not negotiation, it was a variation of, 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 that, of, of that contract. Obviously, there was a recommendation from, 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 from uh, Advocate Kasim, and it's, it's a recommendation. So I want to know what, what, find, what, what was the decision taken by the board on that, on, 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 on that matter, right? All what we know is that um, um, Mr. Kasim is, 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 is uh, no, not Mr. Kasim, Mr. Oppenhauser is, 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 is still there. <clears throat> there is a recommendation coming from, uh, uh, from the advocate that he must be cancelled. I just want to, to ask the, uh, the board, are you happy with the, the recommendation? Is the recommendation? And uh, if the answer is yes, then would you take the same attitude where it a junior official in the company? Is that good co- corporate governance? Because it means everybody else can just renegotiate with himself, and then you you have got these escalations. I think we need to to, to be uh, uh, if we're to be taken into confidence as far as that uh, is, is is concerned. <clears throat> can you can you share with us the OEMs involved uh, in the construction of uh, especially uh, Midup and Kusile, right? <clears throat> and uh, when you do that. Can you also share what was the original price? Where are we now? 
and I see that there are reasons that you have given, but let's 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 have that. <clears throat> Perhaps uh, the if we are just to remind the the the, the, the board, the fiduciary first and foremost, the fiduciary responsibility of directors is to the company. There's a slide where uh, ESCOM is bemoaning the fact that the IPPs and they must pay for it. It's somewhere I can't I can't remember the slide very well. But I, I would like to ask from the uh, um, uh, from uh, ESCOM in them uh, uh, taking in, into consideration their fiduciary responsibilities. What are they doing with that? The the IPPs we know that we are paying uh, far above uh, what we are paying uh, with, uh, from the other sources of of, of electricity. Uh, what is your what your responsibility? Remember, I'm talking about the fiduciary responsibility of the director to the company. Is that to the best interest of ESCOM? In fact, that's 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 the question. Uh, of the seven suppliers that we we we, we, we talk about, um, they, you said there's only one a, a, a supplier that you have been successful with. <clears throat> Perhaps even before on those suppliers, why why are we not giving names of the suppliers? Why are we only giving supplier one, supplier two, supplier three, um, not one. That's one. But two, can you have the names of of the companies that you are negotiating with and that you are that you, you are saying that overcharging uh, ESCOM? Let's have those names. Uh, you know, in the in the spirit of transparency, uh, yesterday we were interacting with National Treasury and we had, and people of South Africa have asked that the people who are involved in PPEs. We want to have the names of those companies published. Any reason why uh, these uh, suppliers, supplier one to supplier seven, we don't know the names. I <clears throat> that's one. But two, I think as the committee would like to know which companies are on, are on a negotiation. It, it can't be secret. It can't be secret, especially when the people of South Africa are paying uh, uh, those companies. We should know who are who are paying, and why is it difficult for you to come to any conclusion about uh, the renegotiation of these contracts in the same contracts. Please uh, share with uh, this committee and the people of South Africa how much is the market price of of, of coal, and how much are we paying for those uh, 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 with those uh, <clears throat> with those companies? And perhaps in the same vein, you may want to say, if we if we are paying the market price, that's how much uh, uh, ESCOM would have saved. Um, <clears throat> but what what power? Does ESCOM have over these supplies? It looks like the, the, the roles are changed because you keep on saying it's more than a year that you have been talking about this thing. You are saying we're not being successful. Who determines the price? Perhaps this goes with the question which I'm going. Does ESCOM have a capacity to manage these contracts? Can, can you please share? Do you have capacity to do that? Because a contract management, it took from the time you enter into a contract and you don't outsource your powers to the supplier, to the person that you pay. But here it looks like we are going to the suppliers and we are begging the suppliers to agree on the prices. So uh, I, would, I would like you to attend to, attend to that. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> let, 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 let me see. I'm still fine. <clears throat> About uh, the, the, the companies which have been overpaid, is there any criminal activity there? Are you... Uh, if if so, apart from the, I know some of apart from the SIU, have you as ESCOM gone out and reported cases to the police? We can't be waiting for for SIU. It's a separate process altogether. But you should from 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 yourself be knowing that there have been this criminal activity, and uh, how many of those cases have been reported to the police? Not those are, which are being investigated by SIU. Um, CO. Please talk about the contract which started at 114 million rand, and uh, we learned that it's now 14 billion rand. Can you please take into this confidence? How does it happen to move from 114 million rand to 14 billion rand? The circumstances of where you 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 do that, or perhaps that's just fiction. I definitely read something about that that contract. Uh, slide two of 15 talking about Midup and Kusile. There's something that says that the contractors did not deliver according to expectations. What were the penalties that they paid if they didn't? If they had expectations, we have agreed, that's what we are going. When you write that contract, in all, at all the times, they'll always be, they always charge us penalties. What penalties if they don't deliver according to the expectations? 
say there's somewhere you said a contract expertise assumed to be there. But it looks like during the process, then it was discovered that that, that expertise was not there. And that's why we are having the delays and so on. And we, 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 are, we, we are paying. If we say it was assumed, didn't they say that they have got that expertise? I think that's what they, they would have said. And that's why in the first instance, they were, they were appointed because of that expertise. I don't see us appointing uh, contractors who don't have an expertise. So if they, they didn't they mislead the board, for instance, let me start there. And if they did, what has been the consequences? What is, the, the, again, the fallback position of, 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 of ESCOM? And what have you done uh, with that? I know that you are paying there are some defects at, at Kusile and, 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 and Midupi that you are dealing with and you are paying for it. Where are the companies that are responsible for those defects? I think I would leave it at, at that exactly. I still at the, okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, and uh, allow um, uh, the, the, the DM and this team and ESCOM to, 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 to respond. Yes. Chair, thank you very much uh, to the honourable members uh, for uh, very clear questions. I will deal with the, I think the question of the board, uh, what is the status of the board and the, the reported uh, goings on within the board after the team would have disposed of the very operational questions in the environment. Uh, the chair can deal with the, some of those, but I'll talk to the question of the board as well. As If, if he may so decide, he will also share some insight as the, as the chair currently of the board. Thank you very much, Chair. Can I invite them to come? Yes. Okay. Can I can I start with the board, uh, Chair, and Deputy Minister, and Honourable Members? First of all, I I want to make the point that there are no divisions within the board of ESCOM. I think we we are quite united. Uh, we work in consultation with each other, we debate issues, and as far as I'm aware, there has been no divisions whatsoever. That occasionally we may differ on a point of view does not imply divisions. It's just part of a debating process and trying to refine each other's ideas. However, there is a, a persistent issue which the Deputy Minister may want to address later on. The board of ESCOM is now deficient with six members that have left the board, six. So we, we are actually in short supply of the appropriate number of board members that we should have at ESCOM. We have uh, tried to, to appeal, I think, to the minister and the department, I think, to fill these uh, positions. And obviously, there are other processes that they are following, and maybe they can give us an update on that. I'm aware that the president and the minister have often said that they want to restructure the board, and they want to complement the board or beef up the board. This has not happened, and this is obviously causing uh, a, a lot of uh, overload on the board. So we require to be beefed up, but as a board at the moment, I think we are quite united. The second issue I want to deal with is the issue of uh, the econ, econ oil uh, matter. This is uh, obviously under uh, legal constraints, but what the board of ESCOM does is it looks at contracts. It doesn't look at who has applied for the contracts. So we don't racialize contracts when they come to ESCOM. We simply look at the quality, the values, the ethics, and the processes that have been followed. And that's all the, and the evidence that is available to support us. So we are not going to say that because there are African women or there are Indian women, that's how we look at the contracts that have been applied to ESCOM. We look at the contract itself and look at the quality and the processes and the systems that have uh, uh, been applied, I think, to that contract, and that's how we ultimately judge them. So uh, I want to again appeal that 
race is not the issue empowerment is not the issue it uh, it is the systems and the processes and the legality and the lawfulness of those contracts that the board looks at through its committees that applies to any other contracts including the econ one that is uh, as i say under legal constraints at the moment the third issue i want to deal with is this matter of quotation that i said that parliamentarians don't know anything about escom i must confess that that is out of character i don't think i could ever say that i suspect that uh, the honorable member must provide me the right quotation it's very difficult uh, to interpret somebody what somebody says i think i seem to recall that i prof, said prof, that uh, yes prof, sorry sorry yes. sorry prof uh, the, the uh, people would want to see the prof please you have video on oh okay i'm sorry yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm i'm sorry chair i just oh. wanted to say that th this sounded to me like it's out of character what i would have said was that there is more that is happening at escom inside and internally than what i think people outside often see that's really i think what i conveyed not that parliamentarians know nothing about escom i could never say that it's just out of character so i would appreciate it if i could get where this quotation came from in the manner that has been articulated today in terms of the the coo matter uh, uh, the one that uh, 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 the chair addressed about the the sanctions i think as the board we have uh, been debating this issue for a very long time there have been two senior councils that have investigated this matter and have absolutely found nothing against uh, uh, mr jan operholzer in fact i think he have gone he has gone out of his way to defend escom even against those uh, people that it is claimed that he had conflicts of interest with he has declared his conflicts of interest and i want to say this categorically as a board we have really not found anything that mr operholzer has done and it's very difficult to understand where this noise is coming from we we have had as i say three senior councils have investigated the matter have found nothing as a board i think we are busy finalizing our own i think decisions with regard to this matter and i want to again share with you in confidence we have found nothing that mr operholzer has done that deserves i think the amount of noise and the amounts of persecution that he is undergoing at the moment so those are the the issues that i wanted to address but i want to emphasize the thing that i think maybe honorable members should take is that as a board we are constrained by the numbers and we require to be beefed up but as a board i think we are united and uh, i think we are trying to do the best that we can we respect i think what the chair spoke about fiduciary responsibilities and we are always reminded of those i think when we take decisions and discussions within the board meetings i think i'll leave it at that and maybe the deputy minister can supplement some of the issues i've left in relation to the board but those would be my answers thank you It's, it's your team it's your team prof it's your it's your team uh, we're listening to you i'll ask the gce to take the rest of the the questions that are operational uh, yeah. because we want to distinguish between oversight and operational issues thank you uh, gce mr andre de reiter thank you very much prof thank you honorable chair thank you honorable members for the questions that were asked um <clears throat> we we appreciate the oversight role that you conduct and uh we we certainly appreciate the scrutiny uh that you put us under um honorable chair if i may um ask uh first of all and i'm trying to group the questions together by subject matter just to make it more efficient if i can ask uh ms elsi pule to please respond to questions relating to uh the age profile 
as well as uh, the race breakdowns for uh, senior level appointments, particularly senior level appointments um, that have recently been made at uh, EXCO level. Uh, and then at the same time also deal with the issue of uh, artisans, uh, internships, and the question around the 4,085 other uh, employees. Um, Elsie, if I can ask you to, to please handle those questions. Thank, thank you. And, and through you, Chair, um, I missed the question on the age profile. I'll take all of them and I'll handle it later once I get clarity. Um, just to provide a breakdown of the 33% uh, female employees at ESCOM, that number translates into about 13,000 of our total complements are female. Um, in terms of the percentages around the occupational levels, at semi-skilled, we've got 26%. That translates into about 2,800. We've got skilled at 35%. That translates into just under 8,000. We've got 39% professional. That translates into 2,500. And we've got 40% senior management. That translates into 159. And then we have got 15% at top management. If I link that to the recent EXCO appointments uh, chair, uh, we, we are 95% um, at concluding the uh, top structure uh, since the appointment of uh, the group chief executive. We have appointed, um, uh, we have appointed about five uh, uh, black um, professionals at EXCO. Um, by the end of October, we would have filled all the positions at EXCO in terms of the appointments, and we would have also increased at um, top management with a black female by end of October. And that also leads to the question around succession planning. Uh, given the fact that we have not had stability for so long, uh, once we have finalized these appointments by end of uh, October, we will then be able to follow our internally recognized uh, succession management program to ensure that we also have got sufficient resources to fill when we attrition happens. If I go to the issue around slide 39, on uh, it, it, uh, the number of artisans and so on, what you'd notice, um, uh, Chair, and the committee in terms of that is that what we use in terms of the naming conventions, for example, let me use the engineering question that it looks like the number of engineers has reduced. So the slide will show a reduction in terms of people who are practicing as engineers in the organization, but our overall number of engineers has not reduced because what you also find, you find that you've got qualified engineers who have moved into managerial positions. So the overall number of engineers at ESCOM is much higher than what you see. What you see here in terms of our system are those people who today are practicing as engineers. The issue of artisans have also been raised in terms of the number. If you look at the, on slide 39, you will see categories of operator, artisan, uh, utility men, uh, um, controllers, that's all in the categories of your uh, 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 level of work in the organization, which is key to the organization. So in that grouping, you're going to find a lot of them might have been trained as artisans, but the way we deploy them, we either uh, appoint them as operators in generation, we either appoint them as controllers and officials in distributions and so on. So that number, if you look at our strategic workforce plan, we are not concerned about the drop because it's also linked uh, to our supply and demand uh, for the next 10 years. Um, the question around LENA, uh, the LENA pipeline, we currently have got 1,517 uh, LENAs, um, 871 are artisans, 465 are engineers, uh, 52 are operators, 61 are technicians, and... Um, 68 are non-technicians. So that is also informed by our strategic workforce plan in terms of the demand and supply of our resources. 
Um, Andra, I don't know if you'd like me to address the issue around the remuneration standards too. Uh, I'll tackle that if you're okay with that. Yes, please, Elsie. Okay, so if you look at the issue around the remuneration standards, uh, from our side, um, we have uh, partially complied. We have uh, 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 submitted our recommendations in terms to the, to the shareholder. What we have also done in the interim before that is being finalized, we have ensured that since um, this commitment, no performance bonuses were paid for the top uh, officials, we have also stopped the long-term uh, incentive scheme for the top, top officials, and we have not even paid the performance bonuses to the rest of the organization in the last two financial years. Um, so, so I think I've covered all of them except the issue of the um, age profile, which I missed, Chair. Um, Honourable Chair, through you, if I may proceed with allocating uh, more questions to my ESCOM colleagues, please. Um, um, uh, CEO, I, I want you to come back to me when you say you have dealt with everything. So uh, I'm, I'm off now, uh, who, are, who are in your hands. Thank you very much, Honourable Chair. Um, Caleb, if I can ask you, please, to deal with the uh, questions around um, revenue, um, as well as uh, issues around the um, internal audit um, on overpayment and the process that we've got in terms of three-way matching to ensure that we uh, have control measures in place to prevent overpayments. Then please also um, comment on uh, cost savings. Uh, the nurse deduction and the age analysis of overpayment. Um, and I think those were the finance questions. Um, Caleb, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, honorable members, uh, I think firstly, the, the question around revenue and the impact of COVID in terms of Eastern financials for this financial year. Uh, Honorable Me uh, Member Klangwini, uh, it has about a 10 billion rand lower revenue impact in terms of volumes multiplied by the price of electricity. How ESCOM is dealing with this change in this financial year, uh, it's linked to what the DCE has said. We need to deliver savings of 14 billion for FY21. Uh, we're on track to deliver that. And as I've highlighted earlier, the one lever we also look at is trying to reduce our capital expenditure to around the 20 billion level uh, so that we can meet our cash flow requirements. And we've made it very clear that uh, there's no further support from government over and above what is already on the cards in terms of the appropriation. ESCAM needs to live within its means. Uh, I think uh, honourable members, it's very important that one appreciates that the finances are also directly impacted by our operational performance. And the more we run our more efficient power stations, the better it does for our liquidity and our cash requirement. In uh, uh, members, uh, in terms of the NASA decision, Yes, correctly. So uh, we're now in the process of an appeal and we will go through that. But from our uh, understanding is that uh, it will take time. It does mean that uh, at a future price determination, there should be price adjustments to recover the 69 billion rand around the appropriations which were deducted by nursing MYPD4. If I didn't touch on some of the other questions, uh, the one around uh, overpayments and the controls, honorable members, yes, we make use of the three-way matching, but I think you've correctly highlighted that it's fine and it, and it does serve and we still use it and it's audited through our SAP system. But if someone falsifies an invoice and doubles that, I think that's where one, you would require whistleblowing to assist you, and two, in terms of the contract management, 
we need we need to do more detail around the adjustments for, from the regional contract, and that's what we'll focus on to try to address and flag potential overpayments in the future. Uh, uh, Honourable Member asked the question, is the cash flows, although it's draft and it's not audited? Yes, cash flows, uh, uh, we don't see that changing by the finalization of the audit. If there's uh, any audit adjustments, it will probably be non-cash related adjustments. Uh, and then I think the member also talked about the impact of IPPs uh, and, 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 and ESCOM losing out uh, sales to IPPs, what that means in terms of our cost base. Uh, honorable members, uh, I think that's where uh, we are dealing with it from a savings perspective, but understanding that currently uh, through the tariffs, uh, ESCOM does recover the IPP cost through the MYPD methodology. And maybe let me just add and close out the, the whole question around the EFC disposal and the delay. Uh, uh, Chair, the two main reasons for that was ESCOM had to complete its governance process to get the approvals to start the, the tender process. It did go out at the beginning of the year. However, due to COVID, we had to extend it. Uh, that process was closed in July and we're currently evaluating uh, the bids around the EFC disposal. Uh, thank you, Andre. Thank you very much, uh, Caleb. Um, can you maybe just also deal with the matter of uh, bad debt from business uh, and what we're okay. doing to cover the bad debt? Thank you. Yes, uh, so, so for this financial year around l large customers, uh, there was 539 million rand worth of bad debts, uh, and this is attributable to companies that have gone into business rescue. Uh, when it gets to industrial cu customers, ESCAM does issue letters of requesting payment, and we do have uh, uh, the action to then switch them off in terms of non-payment. Uh, Andre, thanks. Thank you very much, Caleb. Um, I'm going to ask, um, Avin Maharaj to deal with the uh, questions around um, a further breakdown of the 180 million overpayment and also internal processes that are in place to prevent uh, further overpayments from taking place, particularly from uh, a Kusile project management uh, perspective. And then uh, Avin, if you can... If you can also deal with um, uh, the contractors that um, are currently operating and to what extent um, we exercise control over their compliance. Um, I would appreciate if you could handle those questions. Thank you. From Andre. Uh, Rumble Chairman, uh, I'll deal with the questions as raised by the members. Uh, Honorable Damini, uh, specific with respect to the overpayments around the 180 million, uh, that deals with uh, contracts with the contractors that we've engaged for security provision of security on site, uh, some of the catering services that we've uh, engaged on site, and a large number of our corporate social investment program uh, spend. So. Uh, in terms of that 180 million, it's a collection of uh, uh, those uh, particular work areas, security, catering, and the CSI. Uh, they are with uh, our audits and forensic department, and from a project perspective, we are dependent on them finalizing their investigation, and then as management, we take the, the, the actions thereafter. Uh, specific to the project uh, Chairman, you asked the question around uh, the laying of uh, police or ch charges at police stations. From a project perspective for issues pertaining to site, we have uh, laid charges for various issues, uh, but with these specific investigations, uh, that is how handled through ESCOM's legal uh, department. 
In terms of process enhancements, as Honorable Lamini raised, uh, apart from the three-way matching, uh, additional changes have been made with respect to how uh, changes to contracts are dealt with, whether they are claims, variation orders, or compensation events. And we've implemented cross-functional teams uh, with made up of people, not, not from only within the project. So uh, we've brought in uh, uh, other ESKIM uh, resources, but from outside of the project to maintain that neutra neutrality around issues that have that are raised. So we use cross-functional teams in terms of processing of any changes uh, that are required once a contract is uh, underway. Uh, Chairman, also uh, in terms of uh, Honorable Mutafa asked about recoveries, the intention is that we are pursuing the recovery of uh, any uh, malfeasance wherever possible. And through the SIU, uh, they've confirmed that they are engaging with the assets for feature unit in terms of these uh, recoveries um, for uh, these overpayments. Uh, the Honorable Sheikh. CO, CO, can I get you on? Yes, Honorable Chair. Please have your video on. Yeah. Thank you. Pro proceed. Honorable members uh, and uh, team ESCOM, when you respond, please make sure that your video videos are, are, are on. The technical people are phoning me and get it from them. Please, let's just remind each other that let's, let's do that. Not unless you have got the connectivity problems that will understand. Please proceed. Uh, see you. Understood, Jay. Uh, I will try my video, and if it does fail, uh, then I will switch it off. I was going to address the question about the uh, original costs for Kusile and Midupi. Uh, in the report that we've provided to the committee, on page 78, uh, we illustrate and show the progression of the projects in terms of the approved business cases uh, from inception to the current approvals. Uh, and I would like to repeat from an, a Kusile and a Medupi perspective, the current approved budgets uh, or costs that we approved back in 2015 have not changed. Uh, they are 161 and 156 billion rand, respectively. Uh, uh, Robert Chairman, in terms of the age analysis, uh, the steps and the length of the processes, uh, I undertake to engage with the SIU to to, to get uh, that those processes uh, details so that they can actually be shared uh, with the com with the committee uh, going forward. Uh, Honorable Peters requested the, a list of the names of the companies that have been engaged for both Meduki and Kusile. Uh, in the report that we've provided from page 85 all the way to page uh, 88, uh, we've provided the listing of all of the companies engaged for both Medupi and Kusile, uh, also illustrating the contract values at the start of the respective contracts and as to where they are currently as well. Uh, to date, at uh, Kusile, we've engaged just on 51 uh, individual companies for its full execution, and at Medupi, uh, the figure is 30. 37 uh, contractors that have been engaged for the execution of the project. Uh, in terms of contractual remedies that we've exercised, uh, so uh, one of the learnings has been the limitations in terms of our contracts, but we've exercised them to the maximum. In terms of delay damages, which we are entitled to actually recover, both at Medupi and Kusile, these uh, delay damages have been uh, recovered in excess of a billion rand per project. Uh, there are different uh, values per contract that, we've, that we have recovered in terms of the delays caused by the individual contractors. Uh, ESKIM also has a, a right in terms of counterclaims to the contractors, and we're exercising these uh, to the maximum allowed 
per individual contract uh, chairman. Uh, currently at Medupi, our counter claims of close 2.5 claims uh, exceed well over between 2.2 and 2.3 billion rand per project. So in terms of us uh, exercising our contractual remedies for non-performance by, by contractors that we've engaged with. Uh, so I think I've addressed uh, those questions uh, that you directed towards me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avin. Um, let us now move to uh, matters related to uh, procurement. Um, Solly, if I can please ask you to deal with the uh, demographics of our contractors and also uh, look at the assistance that we provide to uh, SMMEs in terms of enabling them to obtain business from uh, ESKIM. Sorry. Sorry, you may be on mute. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Okay, okay. thanks, uh, Andre. I, I will deal with the <clears throat> questions you raised and the um, other questions relating to that one i will start with the 39 companies that uh, you indicated uh, that they were red flagged the questions was um, how they were identified uh, in the slide we indicated that uh, we requested our data experts to look at the sub system and there were two thresholds that we have used. The first one was we looked at all companies that were above one billion that are open contracts. And we also looked at the abnormal movement, uh, which was 200% and above. And um, that selection from the system uh, gave us a list of 39 companies. But however, uh, we could not confirm whether there are any irregularities in those movements. Uh, that's why uh, we referred that matter to a forensic uh, for them to be able to, to verify. And as soon as uh, we have the outcome, uh, the report will be given to the committee. We however did not look at all the contracts because uh, we have so many contracts in ESCO. Um, measures put in place to deal with the uh, empowerment uh, of companies. Um, with the um, promulgation of the 2017 preferential procurement regulations, uh, as come we are complying with that uh, regulations, and those regulations are able to assist all organs of state to uh, empower. Uh, the previously disadvantaged through uh, subcontracting. And if the contracts are more than 30%, we prescribe uh, those um, subcontracting, and the subcontracting will go to different uh, uh, designated groups, which uh, uh, we can provide information later if uh, it's also required. We have also, through that regulations, are able to pre-qualify a level of companies. We can issue a tender and say a level one, level two uh, will only participate. And when you do that, uh, you will empower uh, most of those um, companies that are previously disadvantaged. Uh, in our slide, we 
did not indicate the the youth companies that are getting the women companies that are getting tenders. Uh, that information I don't have it now, but we will uh, provide it uh, when we uh, go back to the offices. Uh, it will be provided to to to, to members. Then the, there was an issue of the contracts that are more than 20 years. Uh, even that information we don't have it readily available. Uh, we'll look at our system and and we will provide the list of those contracts that may have been uh, in existence from 1994 uh, to, to, to now. Uh, there was a question which will also affect then on the other side of the reviewing of contracts. Um, the general contracts that the national contracts uh, excluding coal, uh, it was OSCOM officials that were uh, reviewing them and, and negotiating. Uh, we did not employ consultants to do that. Uh, thanks, Alex. Thank you, Solly. Um, I'm now going to ask Dan to please deal with um, the issue of uh, procurement of coal uh, on long-term contracts, potentially dating back prior to 1994. Uh, Dan, if you could also deal, um, and this was a question raised by both the Honourable Sheikh Imam as well as the Honourable Peters. And then, um, Dan, if you could also share with the committee the names of suppliers uh, of, of uh, contracts. I think also uh, refer to the estimated duration and the remaining energy that that is um, still required to be supplied under those contracts. And then lastly, um, also address from your side the uh, capability of ESCOM to negotiate contracts. Dan, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me start uh, with, with the names. I mean, the, the companies are the seven companies and in the order of how we've basically uh, indexed them in the submissions are uh, uh, Glencore, uh, Moelase, Arishumeng, Mbuyelo, Universal, African Royalty, and um, Zimkulu Mining. Uh, and similar to, to supply chain management, uh, the, the whole evaluation and review and the building of the model, we, we've done it internally using our mining engineers, geologists, and our our uh, and our accountants. Hello. And, and hello. 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 Uh, my apologies. Yes. I just wanted to interrupt you. Can you slowly speak to the, the name of the companies? We are too we are too fast. Oh, my, my apologies, Honourable Chair. Yeah. Uh, the first one is Glencore, followed by Mwelase, then Arishumeng, uh, Mbuyelo Group, Universal Coal, African Royalty, and Zimkulu Mining. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thanks, Chair. And, and, and similarly to, to, to what my colleagues men uh, mentioned earlier, I think that's the part I was busy trying to give feedback, is that uh, we, we do the analysis, you know, like ourselves. Firstly, we build the, I mean, the, uh, the model for, for, for cost evaluation of, of the different mines. And then we come up with a negotiating strategy and then we negotiate ourselves. So everything is done internally, you know, like in ESCOM. Uh, no, no consultants, you know, like uh, uh, were used. We, we, however, I mean, use a lot of, you know, like uh, tools from from the industry, the same tools that the the mining industry is using. We we use, you know, like uh, other inputs from other consulting houses on some of the, you know, like a uh, um, uh, market intelligence and business intelligence. So we do that quite a lot. We do collaborate with with a number of, you know, like uh, consulting companies. But the actual work is done, you know, like uh, internally uh, within ESCOM. And, and Chair, the, the number of coal suppliers uh, which uh, may predate 1994 or long term, I, I think to make things simpler, we would, uh, I think it would be easier to add them to, to the list that solely will comp compile because it deals with all, you know, like uh, contracts in ESCOM. 
but it is predominantly, you know, like uh, the, the the contracts where the the mine and the power stations were were be, are basically attached. So and the the mantra was, you know, like uh, you you they they would first go on open tender, identify the the source of coal, and then they would build the power station at the mouth of that mine so that you don't transport coal you only transport electricity it's cheaper to transport electricity than coal and and uh, and basically use a conveyor to to basically join the mine and the power station and you design the power station based on that particular coal field so you can have consistent supply so all our cost plus mines uh, there's only five of them remaining chair uh, are basically contracts that were concluded before, you know, like in 1994. They all predates 1994, and they have also start coming to to maturity that is reaching 40 years. And then we have uh, on the fixed price contracts, it's it's two of them, you know, like uh, the one supplying Matimba and the one supplying uh, 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 Duva. The cost plus are the uh, are the suppliers tied to. Letabo, you know, uh, a power station, Tutuka power station, Krill power station, Mata power station, and Kendall. So those have, you know, those long-term uh, cost plus contracts. So those those are the only, you know, like a, a, a seven, you know, like a pre uh, pre nineteen ninety four, you know, like a, a contract. I think post nineteen ninety four, uh, the only, you know, like a, a contract uh, longer than twenty years is basically the Midupi contract, which was concluded in 2008. Most of our medium and short-term contracts, uh, they, they range from a very short-term contract of, of about a month to, to a contract as long as 15, you know, like a 14 years. That's the realm that we are in, but we can certainly provide the other information uh, on the seven that I've mentioned, Chair, as part of the of the submission. And, and if we may be allowed, Chair, in that submission, we will also provide the details on these seven suppliers we were negotiating with, you know, like a, to to show where our, you know, like a pricing point, you know, like a, is that is based on our analysis and the price of that particular contract, you know, like a, show the percentage and the rent value, you know, like that information that we just have to, you know, like a, uh, co uh, collate it in a manner, you know, like uh, that the question has been, you know, like uh, uh, posed to us because that was a trigger, you know, like uh, for those suppliers who were making in excess of about 25% profit margin, which is typically what you'll find in this capital intensive, you know, like a, uh, a mining industry. I okay. just want to refer back to, to, to my notes to deal with the other you know, like uh, questions from the from the other suppliers, yeah, and and I think uh, the 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 long term contracts, which I I, I take it that's what is meant by uh, evergreen contract. Uh, Chairs, I mentioned how you know, like a, uh, th there was never a power station historically in Eskom, which was built without a tight colliery. So the power station, you know, like it was built with a tight colliery, and it's it's a consistent approach globally when you build huge. You know, like a, a power stations or what we call them six packs. You know, like a uh, that you'd have it. You know, like at the mouth. You know, like a uh, of the mine. But the, I mean, the development of that particular colliery is also capital intensive. Uh, you, I mean, if you look at you know the the Midupi expansion and how much Exaro you know like a spend you know like a, to to expand Khrotekhele colliery, and I mean it's in their financial reports and so on. I think they spent in excess of 10 billion rands. So if, if you want, you know, like a consistent supply, high volume, consistent quality, uh, cheap via conveyor, you know, it requires a, a, a large colliery. And to recover the capital cost of the colliery is quite similar to ESCOM. You know, you'd need more time to amortize it over the life, you know, like of the power station, which makes your cash, you know, cash flows much more smoother and, and net, you know, like a, a cheaper, you know, coal. That's basically how these contracts, you know, like a chair, where were were concluded, you know, like they were historically forty-year contracts, and and as we said mentioned, we will give the details on those that were uh, concluded uh, pre ninety-four, and even the ones that are that came after, you know, like in nineteen ninety-four. But that's the basis on which these contracts, you know, were concluded because uh, the assets are also very capital intensive. Yeah, you know? and when you start talking a mine in excess of five million tons per annum, chair, we we definitely talk about uh, a a huge colliery. Yeah? Which requires uh, big funding. Okay. 
Then, then there was a question on on the pricing. Who determines the pricing? Chair, the, the in, in South Africa there is no domestic market similar to 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 the export market. So in ESCOM, all our coal contracts we conclude them through the tendering process, which is prescribed by Triple PFA, and and the the contracts are negotiated and and the ESCOM preferred pricing model is the one where you know like you look at efficient cost uh, of a miner and a fair return you know like otherwise people would not invest you know like a large sums of capital to to establish uh, uh, mines and that's basically you know like a, and and we certainly uh, do not uh, prefer to to have our coal costed using the export you know like price which which is always you know like a significantly higher you know, like for the same quality, you know, like of coal. So our contracts are bespoke and the pricing arrangement is on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the supplier based on, you know, like a, the, the type of colliery, you know, like a, is it open cast underground? How deep is the colliery? What is the quality that does the coal require, you know, like a washing and so on? Where do we need the coal and so on? Yeah. That's that's a basis, you know, like a, on which, you know, like at the price. So it is ultimately a negotiated, you know, like a, a, a price. And, and to link up to the question is that uh, what we saw happening, unfortunately, in 2008, is that all the procurement activities that preceded uh, 2018, so not 2008, 2018, did not yield desired results in the number of contracts that could have been concluded. And we started, you know, like a, a burning coal off our strategic stockpiles. And when we lost, you know, like a, a three, three mines due to business rescue, in February 2018, you know, like uh, we had to rob Peter and give Paul from the contracted coal, which wasn't the rate at which, you know, like uh, our coal stocks were depleting and, and pushed us, you know, to, to embark on an emergency procurement, you know, like uh, late in, in, uh, in, in November, you know, like uh, uh, the same year. And to the effect that uh, when we provide the information that some of these high price contracts are people that in as far back as 2017, you know, like uh, we pushed back, you know, like uh, because of the pricing until we had very few options of people who could supply coal, you know, like uh, uh, readily to ESCOM and, and uh, large volumes. And that's how we ended up, you know, like as mentioned in our submission document of what happened in, uh, in 2018. And, and Chair, I think your questions, I think we've dealt with the name of the supplier. Uh, the capacity chair, we we believe, you know, like uh, there there is capacity uh, in in ESCOM, you know, like uh, and where necessary, we also do use, you know, like a consultants, especially for market research and other things. And then the market price, I've explained, you know, like uh, the question that there is no domestic, you know, like a uh, uh, market price. People always use reference to the export, you know, like a uh, index that is API for uh, pricing via, you know, like a uh, Richards Bay to determine what would be, you know, like uh, the parity price in Pumalana, the mine gate. Thanks, Andre. I think I've, I've covered the, the, all the cold questions here. CEO? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, if I may deal with the remaining questions um, that have not been addressed by my colleagues. Um, the, the Honorable Joseph asked if Eskimo is free of state capture and corruption. I think we are still dealing with a number of legacy issues, so we, we are addressing those. Uh, we, we are cleaning up. Uh, we, we will not uh, rid ourselves of uh, state capture and corruption overnight, but we are certainly trying our best to address that. When it comes to uh, our appeal for cost tariffs, these tariffs of costs reasonably incurred. So we, we do not in our applications, nor does NERSA grant us um, tariffs that are reflective of poor um, costs. Uh, then, um, in, char in, in terms of the electricity price comparison, there was a from Honorable Kwankwa to do a detailed analysis. We can certainly do that, um, and we can then benchmark and, and, and uh, determine what the relative pricing structure of uh, South African electricity is. Um, the um, question whether or not is ESCOM should play in renewables. Um, I certainly believe that ESCOM has a role to play in renewables. Uh, we have recently issued 
uh, a request for expressions of interest to the market to um, assist us with developing strategies for repurposing uh, valve lines. And one of the potential options there is and to install the, renewables. Andre, I, I can see uh, you, you are being affected. Connectivity, you, you may switch off your, your, your video. Okay. I hope that's better. Um, in terms of the Honorable Peter's question um, around uh, the progress with WASA, we have made progress there with a pilot project in Soweto. Unfortunately, we were interdicted by uh, one um, household and that delayed the uh, the process that that has now been resolved and we are now 70 percent advanced with that project um, i certainly agree with the honorable peters that it would be um, an excellent idea for um, local content to be applied to the manufacturing of renewable energy components uh, and we we would um I think seek to, to to emulate some of the very successful policies followed, for example, for the motor industry's development program. And uh, this, however, is a policy matter, and 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 we would therefore leave it to uh, government to uh, assist us in that regard. But from our perspective, we would definitely um, seek to support that. Lastly, honourable chair, in terms of the IPP cost. Um, we are engaging through the DMRE and the IPP office with a view to renegotiate the financing for, uh, in particular, bid window one and two um, in order to reduce the cost. Uh, the, the financing cost at the time for bid window one and two was quite high because of an uncertainty regarding the maturity of the technology and also uh, uncertainty regarding the market, and those have now been resolved. Um, lastly, Honourable Chair, the escalation in the contract that you referred to um, from 114 million to 14 billion, this is the so called Black and Veach contract. Uh, we have done a provisional uh, forensic report on that. We have identified as potential irregular expenditure an amount of 12.7 billion. We will now be embarking on a full uh, forensic investigation to determine exactly uh, if there was any unlawfulness uh, involved in that irregular expenditure um, that took place um, between the period of um, 2009 up until uh, two. So that, that is work in progress, and we, we are going to be investigating that, Chair, and we will then report back to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, DM? Um, I'm thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm listening, no. Chair. No, uh, DM, I was, I was saying if you, you want to wait, because I'm, there's something that I just want to do, and uh, uh, perhaps you may just come in once so that you can no, see. Thank you, thank you, Chair. So Thank I think you, all members, um, I, 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 uh, here is the, the response coming from, uh, uh, from uh, Tim Eskom. Uh, I'll allow you two minutes if there's a follow up that you want to make. Uh, we have negotiated uh, 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 with Parliament, they've given us some more time. So um, it's, it's a rare opportunity where we, we interact with Eskom. Uh, uh, so if you have got any follow-ups that you want to make, and as I'm saying, I'll be very strict, two minutes. Uh, who wants to start? Who wants to start? Chairperson. It's, 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 it's Joseph. Okay. Thank Next. you. Thank you, Chairperson. Just, 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 just wait. Okay. Just wait. Next. Matafa. Matafa. Next. Pankwa Chair. Pankwa. Nsangweni Chair. Nsangweni. Next. Hello. 
I, uh, Peter's new uh, unmute. You are muted. Okay. I'm sure, it's 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 Peter's. Okay. And that. So here's here's my list. Chairperson. Chairperson. Chairperson, I'm here. Uh, I I I beg I, not to make a follow up because I've just rejoined. If uh, you can allow me the first arrangement that I made, that I will yeah. write my questions and email them for a written response. No, but but I, I think we'll, 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 uh, you'll be the first one. You must come in with your, even with your original question. If, if that's fine with you, even now. Um, I know you are struggling to come in. Yes. Uh, you would bear with me then if some questions were asked, Jefferson. The yeah. first one would be going to the, uh, the deputy okay. minister. Just, just wait, just wait, okay. Honorable Manzana. Okay. So I'm having, I'm having Honorable Manzana, Joseph, Matafa, Juan, Juan, Angwin, Peters. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. And that's who? Please, please mute, please mute, please mute. Be careful of your step, David. Please mute, members. Please mute. Mute as a bleep. Okay, that's. That's fine, honorable members. I'll, I'll start with honorable Lenzana. Honorable Lenzana, I was giving okay. others two minutes. You have got four. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Jefferson. Thanks, Jefferson. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the first one to the deputy minister uh, on, on, on challenges uh, relating to the person power and the uh, transition within uh, ESCOM. If we can be briefed as to how far is uh, the CRO's uh, report, because we haven't met the CRO. Then the second one would be, by October, we, we were told that uh, ESCOM had a challenge with uh, a lot of unpayments, uh, which were ranging at above 36 million. What is the state of affairs now? Uh, then the last one, Chair, the very, very last one, would be, fortunately, I had uh, the response which re 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 responds to this question of the coal suppliers. Uh, and now, if then there is actually no determinant in terms of prices, where else can ESCOM verify their prices? And also, uh, what is the relationship between the suppliers and ESCOM. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Joseph? Honorable Joseph? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I would just would like to know, as a follow-up, um, if there are any concluded positive, concluded, conclusive positive or negative results relating to the recovery of money. In other, words, in other words, I would like to know if there are any um, any contracts or recovery of money projects that is concluded, whether it was positive or negative outcomes, but that is concluded and that we put it behind us. Um, if ESCOM have that uh, information, because a lot of the things are ongoing, but what is concluded that we can absolutely say we put it behind us and we can do a tick box on that and move on. And then I would like to know the housing subsidy scheme. I accept there must be benefits to staff. The subsidy, and I'm talking about cost now. Uh, exactly. What is the percentage that they give? They the, give the, the percentage that they give the loan to staff? What is the budget, the budget, the budget annually to provide housing subsidy schemes? And what is the percentage? And then the last point, um, I will do a follow-up question on this. Uh, last year I asked questions about electricity supply to our neighboring countries. Um, I would like to know if there is payment from these countries, outstanding payments, and if they, if, yeah, but I'll do the follow-up questions on the, on the contract itself um, as to what ESCOM is struggling with. Does it affect any neighboring countries, governments as well? Um, in terms of uh, supplying electricity. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Orl Matafa. Thank you very much, Chair. Now, mine is very brief, Chair. Actually, I'll take a few seconds. 
it's on the compliance with the special appropriations conditions. And uh, I think maybe on this one, the DM uh, might be in the best position to assist. Um, out of the four conditions that the DPE had to ensure compliance with, only two have been achieved. And I'm raising on this one, Chair, because in one of our engagements with uh, ESCOM, they indicated that they do not feel the role of oversight from the DPE. Uh, you'd remember that uh, we even raised on it to say it's an indictment of the legislature where an entity is saying that we are not properly managed as far as oversight is concerned. So my question would be, how then would the and the ensure compliance with all those conditions that have been uh, attached to the special appropriations bill, particularly those that actually are situated in the purview of the DPE. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Robert Nkwankwa. <coughs> Chair, Chair, thank you very much. I think on the uh, Honourable, uh, uh, I've been covered on the question about uh, electricity supply to neighbouring countries. But there's a specific question. I think I was probably was not clear when I spoke about age analysis when it comes to the overpayment of suppliers. If, if there's a report out there that exists of this issue, you'll pardon me, Chair. But I want to make an example. When you work in the bank, if your account is overdrawn, there would be a detailed report about when did the incidents of uh, overdrawing the account okay, who was responsible for it. What interventions have been taken to try and address that or address that situation? It's that kind of report detailed with interventions that say how far is the process, but done for each and every single one of those overpayments. To say, for an example, you have, this company was overpaid for the first time in 2017 with 200 million rents. What did we do? When did we pick it up? How did we allow other overpayments to occur? If there were a series of payments that took to place over the all of those things to say what were the weaknesses in the control measures, right? Then you are able to pick up who was responsible for it and hold those people accountable so that we can see that it's not just the companies that we're dealing with who we're trying to recoup money, but the officials responsible for it are also held to account. And that we're able every time ESCOM appears before the committee to keep track of the progress of each and every one of those transactions. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable and Tlangwini. And after that, Honorable Peters. I'm starting to experience uh, uh, connectivity problems. So uh, immediately, Honorable Nklangwini finishes. Honorable Peters, please come in. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. And I agree with Kwangkwa because I was also not sufficiently answered based on the in uh, strengthening the internal process capacity of, 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 of ESCOM Chair. And I want to shoot straight to the compliance issues yet again. Uh, uh, chair and the conditions put before uh, um, ESCOM, uh, why are they not adhering to the compliance um, of National Treasury um, on the conditions that was put in front of them? And then also, Chair, on the uh, remuneration standards, um, um, that is still awaiting, uh, and there the, the, the Deputy Minister can maybe, or the DG can maybe assist us with um, the remuneration policy as to when will that be finalized, um, Chair. Um, thank you very much. Peter? Chairperson, uh, I think I'm also not sufficiently covered in the response to the question related to which companies from the companies that were overpaid also featured in the competition com uh, commission's construction corruption saga i i have not heard a, a, a response that tells me that there has been an evaluation or a scrutiny by escom on the repeated uh, involvement of some of these companies in, 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 in corruption uh, issues with regard to ESCOM. The, the, the question related to, 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 to the, the companies that were mentioned, I, um, Chairperson, I would really like it, maybe the committee secretary could have picked it up, 
but uh, for us to get that uh, those questions again and again Jefferson, i am not satisfied uh, the, the, the 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 response related to the the seven suppliers my issue is why did the renegotiation of contracts go to this seven particularly but also my concern Jefferson, is that this seven it's actually small fries it's not the big companies and that's why i wanted to know why is the big companies not considered for especially those who are in the diesel and gas as well as in the coal space who to renegotiate these contracts for them but also i have not had a reply to why the reduction in the number of engineers ESCOM is an engineering intense company and my worry is since 2013 the number of engineers has drastically reduced so it means when an engineer retire or resigns or dies they are not replaced so that for me is a concern Jefferson. thank you thank you thank you honorable peters um I think it's 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 me. Um, let 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 me start. this. Uh, <clears throat> can you just share again with us the escalations at Mitupi and Kusile, the initial budget? Where are we now? And where do we hope uh, by the time we finish? Where are we going to be? I think that's let's 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 have that so that I'm not very clear. <clears throat> um, and related to that. Uh, oral members, we can't have such big overruns and nobody has been held responsible for those overruns. No company has, has been held uh, uh, responsible for those overruns. I, I heard of a, 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 a 2 billion rand, 2.5 billion rand plus minus, which has been recovered. It's, it's nothing in the bigger scheme of things. We're talking about billions here. I think uh, the last time uh, we spoke about this, it was about 150 billion rand overrun. But that's why I want I would like ESCOM to just uh, tell us exactly how big is the overrun now and what is the estimated uh, uh, cost. At, 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 this this thing I I don't I, it doesn't feel like somebody has been or a company has been held responsible for 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 this. I want I would like to hear uh, what uh, ESCOM has to say about about, about this. Um, the, cha the chairperson of ESCOM says when we're talking about econ oil, we don't racialize contracts. I don't know what exactly that means because one may read in that statement that em empowerment, black econ empowerment, which is <laughs> which has, has a lot to do with race because of our past, which, which we are trying to. I, I, Prof, I don't want. Do I hear you very well when you say you don't racialize, you don't look at the race when you deal with contracts? Well, how, how do you deal with a, a, a black economic empowerment then if you don't look at the race of, of, of these contracts? Um, um, I think we, 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 we need, to, I think we are going to interact and, and, and DM, we need to get closer to this thing. We, we, want, we want to see the role of, of ESCOM. One, what are they doing as far as broad place uh, black empowerment? They, they can't deal with this matter as if they're a private company which is being pushed and so on. And I think the department, if the department will get closer to this, in terms of deracialization, they've got big budgets and, and we as government are also giving them a lot of money. So we want to, to, to see their, their strategy as, it come, as far as that's concerned. This is also related to what uh, Honorable uh, 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 Peter has raised. The, the, what is the role of ESCOM as far as localization is, is concerned all, all around? And again, we'd like to see when it comes to the professionals, are they used uh, uh, in their budget? What is it that goes to black professionals in uh, uh, general? We want, I think that's the engagement and we'd like the department to get closer to that because we're going to interact on that big time. We'd like to see the role of, of ESCOM and we're doing that with, with all the other SOCs that we interact with and even with the departments. Because the question of re, uh, uh, reigniting the economy of this country and deracializing the economy of this country 
is not only a, a government's responsibility or one department's responsibility. It's our collective responsibility. And I would like a, 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 a DM that you really get closer to that because we are going to be really a, a calling you back and would like uh, this, what was given to us it's something that I usually get from uh, uh, from the companies where they tick box and say they have dealt with this thing. It doesn't feel like a company which is owned by government. It doesn't feel like a company which goes to parliament and asks for uh, recapitalization and bailouts. So we need we need more interaction as, uh, 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 interaction around that. And the board this should be a board issue. Um, <clears throat> um, now. We, we were told as to how these, uh, how the, or oh, let, let me come to the, to the uh, <coughs> uh, we ask about what is the market price of coal? And the response was all those negotiation and so on. Can we get the average market price factoring all those things in, into consideration? Because I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't have um, uh, one company, we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are paying, let's say 400 rand per ton, and the other one, you are paying 1,500 every time, and then you find an excuse for that. So can you please have a, 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 an average price uh, of, of that, factoring all these things that uh, uh, were, allude, were alluded to? And then I would like, I think it's again on the broad-based black empowerment. Have this type of a contract been awarded to a black company? Uh, where for instance you go, we, 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 <clears throat> we're definitely uh, taken into account as to how you get into the price, uh, where you, you, you they end up having to establish a, a, a mine and so on. Uh, can we also share with us, is there, is there a black company or a company from any of the designated group which has enjoyed uh, 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 what is being provided to these uh, uh, types of, 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 of companies? Chair, uh, 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 honorable members, I, I want to come back to, to the professor. <clears throat> Um, I think you are saying about two or three senior councils have, have, have been um, um, <clears throat> used to deal with this matter, and the board has come to the conclusion that there's nothing wrong about this. Uh, I would like to hear the chair again on this matter. Is it true that Mr. Opel, okay, let me also take the, the fact that he declared his interest. There is no personal vendetta from any of us here. It's something which is out there and people have raised it. But I want to, to, to check. <clears throat> uh, one, I think what, what is coming out very clear is that uh, Mr. Opel Hosa declared the interest. Having declared interest, now, was he involved in the, in the negotiation of the escalation of, of, of prices uh, with uh, stock and stock? I think that's a... <clears throat> If he was involved, is that not a conflict of interest? The fact that you have declared interest doesn't mean that you can do anything. My understanding of that, uh, let, if he had declared that interest, when that matter came out, came up, he would have uh, excused himself from these negotiations because this is like negotiating with yourself. So uh, I want to get from the board, is the board saying that, no, no, no there was nothing wrong about Mr. Opelhauser in him being involved in the negotiation with a, a, a company where he has got shares. I, I don't take an issue about him declaring an interest, but my understanding of declaring interest is that when you declare interest and then there's something which comes in front of you where you are, you are, you are conflicted, you excuse yourself. But is the board saying, no, 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 that's, 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 that's fine. So it means in everybody as comp can get into that thing and negotiate and, and the board won't be able to, to hold anybody responsible. I would like to hear you, a uh, 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 chair, and a uh, DM. If you if you don't mind, you may also uh, come in on 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 on, the, on that. Yeah, I think let's uh, 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 let's 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 allow you a uh, 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 DM and uh, and team escom, uh, and if uh, you can be um, latest latest, please uh, take us to Koratun. No, got about 30 thank minutes. you, Chair. Mm. No, thank you, Chair. Can, mm. can I ask uh, Prof uh, to to kick off first, and then uh, the, the the group chief executive, uh, and then I will I will wrap up. Still, attend to the issues that have been referred to my way. Yeah. Okay. Very, come in, Prof. Prof. Yeah. Th yeah. Prof. Th thank you. Prof. Thank you, Chair.
let me let me let me let me uh, uh, be visible again. Just a second, Prof. While we are becoming visible, just hold. There's one matter I forgot to 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 to, to address. <clears throat> um, the professor raised a, a, a matter which was a, one honourable member raised about how, uh, uh, as far as concerned, it came out on 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 the question of uh, uh, the, the the members, the MPs, knowing or not knowing. Uh, what is it's, it's happening, and I think the the uh, the professor has, 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 has explained himself as far as that is is is, is concerned, and I, I would uh, uh, ask the honourable members or oral member to accept the professor's uh, ex, 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 ex explanation. We have got no reason, but uh, obvious when the when there's communication, there's a communicator and a recipient. If that's how it came up, and this has been uh, ex, ex, explained, and I think let's 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 take it as a matter that has been dealt with. And uh, the 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 explanation is, is is accepted. Prof, please come in. Thank you. I will uh, I will ask uh, uh, Professor Mungalo to deal with the legal issue in relation to the declaration of interest of Mr. Oberholzer. Oper but I I just want to 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 state uh, a few things. First of all, I think uh, I spoke about that we don't racialize contracts, and what I mean is that. In a country like South Africa, we accept that there is a B BEE law or a proclamation. Uh, everybody uh, uh, in a company like ESCOM has policies around BEE. And in the process of evaluating every contract, that kicks in during the evaluation and assessment of a contract. When it comes to the board, uh, it is the highest level at which I think we have to ensure that that contract is, you know, is beyond reproach. And we deal with it in terms of the systems and the processes of evaluation without having to re regress to the level of where it comes from. That's the first component. The second component says that there is no law in the Constitution that says black people can just do unlawful things and they will be forgiven because they are black people. It doesn't, there is no such a thing in our constitution. So we have to evaluate every contract in terms of its legality and in the manner in which it was evaluated within the constitution and within the law of the country. That's what I was meaning about the racialization or the deracialization of the way we look at contract as, as the board. I will then ask, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Dereta and uh, and uh, and uh, Professor Mungalo, I think, to deal with the issue of uh, the conflicts of interest that has been raised by the chair. Uh, Professor Mungalo or Andre? Thank you, Chair. Uh, maybe what I need to do is to uh, start first by uh, extending my greetings to the. Uh, honorable members and also members of the committee and the deputy uh, minister. I am uh, the member of the People and Governance Committee and also the chair of the People and Governance Committee. First, in answering the question as to whether the conflict of interest that involved execution of the uh, documents relating to the modification of the contracts involving the company in which the COO had a uh, conflict of interest, I must point out that ESCOM's policy is now aligned to the Companies Act, particularly Section 75, which requires that in making a decision, uh, any board uh, committee or board uh, should avoid uh, any member actually making a decision or being part of the decision making when they are conflicted. The best they can do is to just declare and then leave the meeting. But our investigation has actually shown that uh, Mr. Oberholzer signed off on a submission to ESCO Tender Committee on the 11th of December 2019. And uh, furthermore, on the 27th of January 2020, he signed off on a submission to the Investment and Finance Committee. Now, in line with the decision-making process at ESCOM, this decision on modification was actually the decision of the IFC. IFC is the board, is the board committee. 
it is not a a an executive committee. The the matter was finally had had to be decided by the board committee. Now, when when Mr. Oberhoser appeared in the board committee IFC, he was appearing on the basis that he had actually signed on the submission in line with what the presentations are made by the committee members, by the uh, 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 executive officials before the committee. But he was not responsible and he was not part and parcel of the decision making when it comes to the modification. And in fact, the modification was supposed to be approved by IFC, of which Mr. Operosa is not a member. When a, when, a, when a modification is approved at the IFC level, it is approved by board members. And board members are the ones who can actually execute on the approval of those board committees. To the extent that he was required in line with his duty to sign off on any documents that are going to go to the committee, that is what he was actually doing, but he was not approving. The approval ultimately rested with the IFC, which is the board committee of which Mr. Operosa is not a member. As a result, I think in line with the board policy at ESCOM and also in line with the Section 75 of the Companies Act, it's very clear that he had no role whatsoever and he couldn't play any role in the approval of the uh, of the of the modifications that were, were requiring the board, board committee, which is the IFC, of which he's not a member. Thank you. Uh, Andre, do you want to add anything to the to the to uh, Professor Mangalu's uh, contribution before we Andre the rate? Andre, uh, uh, thanks, Prof. Um, I think Professor Mangalu covered it well. Okay, thank you. I'm in your hands, Chair. Thanks, Prof. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 Professor uh, Mongolo covered it well. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, Honorable right. Chair, with your permission, if I may proceed to addressing some of the other, the other questions. Okay, please, please proceed. Andre, can you proceed to address the other questions so that you can save us time? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll um, request that um, our Chief Legal Counsel, Bartlett, yes, Prof, will do. Um, Thank you, Nadal Chair. Sorry, Chair, sorry, we seem to have lost our, our colleague somewhere along the, uh, the line. What okay. issue do you wish me to cover? Oh, sorry. What will go ahead? Uh, the matter is included, and we have actually settled the matter. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, the, the, there are two matters in respect of which uh, recoveries are concluded, um, as posed by Honorable Member Joseph. We have uh, recouped uh, an amount of 171 million rand from Deloitte Consulting. That matter could be taken as closed. Uh, the other matter in respect of which we successfully recovered is the McKinsey uh, and Company uh, uh, the recruitment of 1.1 billion rand. Uh, thank you, Chair. And that matter as well could, could be taken as closed. The, the, the matters that are, are still pending are in our slides 76 to 80. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bartlett. Caleb, uh, can you please address the quantum of the house? Housing subsidy that is extended to ESCOM employees through uh, EFC. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, members, uh, uh, in terms of the housing subsidy, it's to our bargaining unit employees. 
uh, on average, uh, a bargaining unit employee receives in the region of about 3,500 rand per month uh, housing subsidy from ESCOM. And uh, that's around the housing subsidy. And maybe let me just address the one on the neighboring countries. The only outstanding debt from our neighboring countries is with uh, EDM Mozambique of 470 million. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kayla. Um, if we can then move to um, the the question around the um, overpayment. Um, thank you, Honorable Kwakwa. Uh, we will provide a detailed report as requested. Um, we will um, also revert back to the committee, and, and, and I don't know the answer to the question, uh, which of the companies that have been doing work for ESCOM were involved in um, potential violations of the Competition Act during the um, period of the construction of uh, World Cup stadiums. That was my understanding of the question, and, and, and we would need to go and uh, look at that and cross-reference and then come back. I think just to explain um, the decline in the number of engineers as um, reported in the numbers, as Elsie uh, explained, this is more a question of, of nomenclature. So instead of calling somebody an engineer, we will now call that person an operations manager or a maintenance manager. So he or she will still be doing engineering work, but um, will be recorded at a, at, a, at a different um, level of nomenclature in the organization. So it does not mean that we are losing engineers per se. We have, we've just um, changed the, um, the names of the positions. Uh, we can certainly also revert to you with um, what we are doing to promote the use of black professionals. We are uh, very close with the Black Management Forum and also the Black Business Council, and we engage with them regularly. And um, in that capacity, they, they um, also work with us to advance the cause of black professionals, and, and, and we certainly enjoy a very positive and collaborative um, relationship with them. Uh, Honorable Chair, you asked a question around the uh, average market price for coal for the FY20 financial year we had a budget uh, of 537 rand per ton the actual cost that we achieved during FY20 was 527 rand a ton so slightly below budget I just have to stress that because of uh, differences in coal quality, mining methods, distances, uh, the, the size of the seam, the quality of the reserve, within that average number, there is a wide range of uh, different prices that make up that, that average. Then, um, Jay, with, your, uh, with regard to your question on the cost overruns, the initial um, cost for Madupi, uh, was 68 billion rand, and that has since increased to uh, 145 billion rand. Um, this does not include any interest incurred during construction, nor does it include uh, flue gas desulfurization, which we are still required to build at Madupi. At Kusile, the initial scope of work included um, flue gas desulfurization, so the initial cost was higher at 84 billion rand, and the uh, estimated total cost, again excluding interest incurred during construction, uh, is now at 162 billion rand, uh, and that then includes the, the FGD. Uh, Chair, those were the questions that, that I recorded as being addressed to ESCO management um, Please uh, remind me if I've uh, missed anyone. Yes, uh, 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 SCOI. And then I said, with all these overruns, is it true that nobody has been held 
accountable, an individual or a company, and so on. And because uh, 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 I may be wrong, my hypothesis is that there was something wrong, there was something illegal, let alone wrong in the in the, in the process. Um, I, it, it may be a true, a, a, a correct or wrong, but you 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 get the gist of my of my question. Yes, um, Honourable Chair, I think the 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 answer is twofold. On the one hand, as my colleague um, Avin Maharaj explained, there were various reasons why um, the initial cost estimate was uh, inaccurate and why we incurred significant cost overruns. It was partly due to the fact that we started with construction while the design was not yet finalized, and this, this caused significant scope changes during the construction process, and scope changes always create uh, cost overruns. Then, uh, as, as you will have seen from the report uh, with regard to the um, potential overpayments, uh, in particular at Kusile, again, that uh, my, my colleague, Mr. Maharaj, explained, where we have concrete evidence of overpayments, and this is the, uh, the, the amount of $4 billion, we are working with law enforcement authorities to the extent that we uh, are able to hold people accountable still in the employ of ESCOM. That is what we do. We, we follow disciplinary processes. But just pointing out the obvious, we don't have uh, powers of arrest and prosecution. And once we hand over uh, the, the dockets and the cases that we've prepared, to law enforcement agencies, uh, those matters are really out of our hands. Uh, we, we do try and follow up and we engage and we assist, including with the SIU, the Hawks, uh, Asset Forfeiture Unit and so forth, um, but we are not in control of those processes and we can't uh, drive them to their uh, full and final legal conclusion. Thank you, Chair. Okay. DM. Um, uh, no, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you to the honoured members uh, for a very extensive engagement uh, with, uh, with ESCOM. Uh, just a few things, uh, Chair, that I will uh, just comment on. Firstly, it's about uh, the capacity of the board. I think the professor did make uh, an impassioned plea there that uh, the, bo the board is not at the moment uh, in full strength. It is a matter that is presently at the at, at door of the minister, uh, for which uh, pending a conclusion of consultations that are necessary, we should augment uh, the board uh, as a matter of agency. Uh, so I would uh, be happy to come back uh, to the committee in respect of uh, uh, the progress in that respect. Uh, the matter of the capacity of the board is being considered at the highest level at DPE, the, at, at the minister's office. And secondly, the yeah. matter... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Yes, Chair. Uh, uh, just now that you are talking about the board, uh, yeah. the prof yeah. spoke about six members of, of the board who have, re have yeah. since resigned. Uh, do you perhaps know why they resigned? Or do, do you care to get the reason why they're resigning? If you can answer that, well, it's fine. If you don't, it's okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm not in a position, Chair, to, to say specifically now. Uh, okay. but, but certainly because uh, there would be various reasons, including exit interviews, mm -hmm. we could come back uh, with a composite uh, report in that respect as to what has been found to be the... Uh, co they may vary from individual to another, but surely there could be a sense made out of that as to what the circumstances were or are uh, that the board is, is presently uh, going through. I may as well just confirm, uh, because we have not had a report to the contrary in respect of uh, the members of the board as currently constituted, if amongst them there are indeed uh, such a, a, a divergences uh, to a point that the, the board it can be construed to be at war with itself. We, we really do not have that, but it is indeed these questions that have to do with uh, completing the composition, the full complement uh, of the board. 
secondly, the method I was going to comment to is what Honorable Tanguini had uh, referred to uh, in, in the latter comments, uh, the remuneration policy uh, for the entity. Uh, it has since been approved, uh, signed off, and sent back uh, to the entity. The assumption I could make is that it is now going through the structures before it reaches the board uh, in terms of the government structures uh, within within ESCOM. But I know from DPE point of view, it has since been signed off uh, for execution. Uh, the third, uh, the third matter, uh, just to comment on, uh, and admittedly, chair, if if colleagues at ESCOM uh, have a sense that uh, our oversight instruments are not robust enough, they feel sometimes they are on their own. Perhaps we have reason to look back over the instruments we have, uh, strengthening uh, particularly the, the, the monitoring of adherence. We do have uh, the shoulders compact as well as the, comp uh, the corporate plans as the instruments through which we monitor uh, a performance of all the entities. Perhaps it's something that uh, uh, from the comments that they are making, we, ha we, sh we shall have to really strengthen on our part. We fully agree with the members of the committee that uh, it cannot be, and I'm, ha I'm happy uh, the professor came back to clarify the issue of uh, the objective uh, that within our procurement environment is, is there, uh, other socioeconomic imperatives that must be met, Black economic empowerment as a key policy of government. It is something that uh, cannot be uh, uh, not looked at in all the encounters in respect of uh, all the bids and the decisions that are made thereof. Perhaps uh, to, given the size of the spend within ESCOM, yes, we may have uh, really had uh, to look at the issues to do with, uh, even as you started the meeting, Chair, you commented on load shedding that is affecting the country, affecting our meetings even right now. Perhaps there's too much focus on trying to ensure cleaner and cheaper energy for the country. Uh, we might not be having a proper look at the other things. Perhaps uh, I agree that uh, we should not lose sight of those and we will look at them and we'll come back and we'll be happy to come back to the committee in respect of those. Other than that, uh, we thank you, Ch Chair, the engagement has been a bit uh, extensive. At least I'm happy the quality of documents that have been submitted has somewhat, I think, met uh, the requirements uh, that uh, often the committees complain about. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will be happy to come back to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank, thank you at, 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 at DM. And uh, perhaps let me just uh, um, uh, start where you ended, that the question of uh, the information that we 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 were given, and uh, as you would have seen, um, um, your 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 team addressed all the issues that we have raised. Uh, they addressed, and obviously there were, there were other things which came up, and uh, we have we have uh, <coughs> said that those things should be at, at, attended to, um, and would would would, uh, um, <coughs> would would like you to to follow up on those. The others that I've said, I think they they fall squarely on the on the shareholders' lap. And uh, please, please follow up on, 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 on that one. But thank you very much. Um, there's a, I, I don't want to, 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 what they flog at, 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 to flog a dead horse. But I, 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 I think as far as uh, Mr. Mang Mangalos, uh, the COO thing, right? <clears throat> there, there is. Well, I, I think just yes, said there's nothing wrong, but in Advocate Kasim's thing, he said the board should cancel uh, Mr. Oppenhauser. What was that cancelling for? And has the board done that? That's uh, uh, before we, 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 we finish. And I also heard that the, the only involvement of Mr. of Mr. Kasim was signing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm definitely not a lawyer, but when you put your your, your signature on that. What what does it mean? Um, um, uh, what what exactly? What is the, impo the, the, the importance of of, 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 of of that signature? I'm still trying to work it out on 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 on, on my head. I don't know whether uh, Mr. Mongalo in, in a minute would like to educate me on that one and the committee. Chair, 
Chairperson. Yes, yes, Mr. Jo Honorable Joseph. Uh, just to support you on that uh, uh, further question, my, my question would be if, if, if whatever Mr. Oberon have signed off, um, what was put before him was that above board? That's the question one should ask also. Because if he signed off on something that he was comfortable with or not comfortable with, that is the question that one needs to ask. Besides the fact that he excused himself with the decision making, but when the information appeared before him, was that an information that he would that he would adequately represent the company in in, in, in any further other questions? Was that information that he signed off above board and acceptable? Thank you, Chairperson. Yeah, I I, I allowed the Honorable Joseph to 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 come in because I could see you itching, but I'm I'm, I'm trying to Mr. Mungalo, one one minute. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, when it comes to the decisions that are made in committees and in board, we are, as the board members, led by the um, different uh, executive members of the organization who actually bring documents for us to see if a decision that we are taking is actually very well uh, motivated. But the, the reality is we take a decision based on the information that is before us, and that information is prepared through memoranda that are prepared by the executives or other employees. And therefore, they sign just for the purposes of memorandum to be presented before committees and for us to make decisions. And that is not the decision of the, of the organization. They are just saying this is the motivation for the, uh, for the, for, that goes to the committee. But the committee ultimately makes a decision. And that the decision is only implemented after it has been, uh, it has been agreed upon by the committee or the board. Uh, if the matter actually ends up at committee, which is very rare, then that will be the decision of the company. But usually the, the committee also recommend that uh, to the board, which finally makes a decision on the, on, the, on the particular aspect. And therefore, in this regard, it was the decision that had to be motivated towards the IFC, and the IFC had to ultimately recommend towards the board, and the board ultimately took a decision. And, and uh, Mr. Oberhauser is not a member of the uh, IFC, and neither is he a member of the board. And that is why we're saying that you couldn't have made a decision on behalf of the organization when, in fact, the decision was for the IFC and the board. Yeah, the, 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 last, the last part of my question, I, I said Advocate Kasim talks about uh, the counseling. Him, what was it being counseled for? That's one. And, and two, has that happened? And what was the outcome of that counseling? Yes, as far as I am aware, uh, Advocate Kasim made a recommendation that According to him, technically, he should have totally uh, not taken part even in the signing. And he then later on and said that that you know, falls squarely within his responsibility and therefore he should be cancelled on the basis that he shouldn't have been involved at all. And as far as I know, the, 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 the GCE has actually cancelled uh, Mr. Oberholzer on the fact that uh, it would have appeared that uh, he is actually motivating on something that he is uh, he is uh, conflicted in and therefore maybe someone else should have uh, appended their signature and as far as I know that that uh, that uh, counseling has actually led to even uh, Mr. Oberhoser disposing of the uh, the equity investment that had actually even deteriorated to an extent that it was almost next to nothing when when he disposed of it okay Mr. Mugal, you see your conclusion and Kasim that he was not supposed to be involved at all. That's 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 what. So yeah, well, he's a technical point of from technical point of view, but that is not what is in line with uh, the, the, the 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 requirements of the policy. The policy is aligned to Section seventy five of the Companies Act, which says that if you are a decision maker, you cannot make a decision on the matter in which you are conflicted you must make a declaration uh, or a, a, a disclosure and then leave the meeting. But in this case, he was not even responsible for making a decision. The decision was that of the IFC and of the board. Okay, that's, that's, that's fine. Thanks, thanks, thanks for, uh, for, 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 for that. And I, I, I think I'll, one thing I wouldn't uh, be comfortable with leaving without addressing. Um, um, Prof, I think the uh, uh, Deputy Minister did it with the my where I was coming from about the black economic empowerment thing and uh, the statement that I referred to and you explained it 
Um, but I'm a little bit worried about the conclusion that you made that being black doesn't mean that you should be involved in unlawful things. Uh, uh, we are lawmakers here, and we are the last people who will say to people who are coming here that they must do things which are, are unlawful. I, I, it, it, uh, it was more about addressing the, the, the broad-based black empowerment, and I was very uh, explicit on that. I, I said, do I hear you saying that when you look at these things, you don't look at black empowerment, and black empowerment it's a, it has to do with uh, correcting the uh, the racial imbalances. So race it's inherent in 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 in, in, in that. Uh, if perhaps uh, I was misunderstood to be saying that uh, uh, black people can't be allowed to be involved in uh, unlawful and illegal, I, I think it's definitely a wrong uh, uh, and, and, and understanding. I just thought let 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 me correct uh, uh, that. <clears throat> But I, I, I think the oral members would, would agree with me, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, that uh, as you have said, that the engagement uh, uh, has, has, has helped us. Um, and also I think it has helped you, as you have said, the issues that we've, 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 we've raised um, <clears throat> in our responsibility um, and uh, based on, uh, <clears throat> um, on, the, on, 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 on the Money Bills Act. That's 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 uh, that's the act which empowers us to engage with you, the manner we've uh, we've 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 we've, we've done. <clears throat> uh, there's no doubt that the role that ESCOM plays uh, in the socio-economic conditions of the country, it, it's a role which can't be played by anyone, at least uh, uh, for now. Um, when ESCOM um, um, coughs, the whole economy catches the cold. But uh, thank you very much. Everybody who has, who has attended, I would also like to thank the honourable members and everybody involved. Deputy Minister Chaperson, uh, Team Escom CEO, uh, the executives who are here. Thank you very much. This brings us to the end of the meeting. Uh, honourable members, I know that uh, we are still having meet, meet uh, National Treasury. Thanks, thanks, thanks for coming. Darren, um, uh, uh, I know that you still have got minutes, but uh, I think we'll attend the minutes. Uh, we'll try to do the minutes at uh, uh, the next uh, uh, meeting. But thank you very much.